Hi guys, my name is Attorney Manny Sarah of the Rosin Law Firm. I'm the managing partner of our firm. Uh, we're here to provide you a um, presentation on how to handle your first DUI uh, in the state of Florida. We practice primarily in South Florida, so Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach County. Um, but a lot of this obviously is going to be applicable throughout the state. So uh, happy you're with us. Hope we can help you out. Uh, there's going to be four different sessions that we're going to go over uh, with some colleagues of mine. Um, session one is the one I'm going to be doing, so obviously it's going to be the best one. Uh, the initial client me that's where you find a lot of gold and you can set the trajectory of your case. Session two is going to be how to issue spot and work case pretrial. So this is going to be those legal loopholes, those motions to suppress, motions to dismiss, and kind of issue spotting, uh, things to look out for. Session three will be the basics of DUI science and field sobriety exercises. So if you're concerned about how do I breed a breath case? Is the breath test infallible? Um, what are these standard field sobriety exercises really testing? How are they measured? Um, we'll go over all of that with you. That's always a, probably the most fun of all of them. Um, and then four is the DUI trial experience. So obviously not a lot of cases actually go to trial, but many of the DUIs get set for trial, um, especially if you're in a county that kind of does that rocket docket or that very quick misdemeanor um, counter call status case, just they'll jump you right into a trial. So we'll teach you how to kind of prep up to that and make sure you're prepared, motions in limine, um, things of that nature, jury selection, all that. Um, what we've experienced throughout our career that can give you some tidbits and help you uh, kind of evolve your case and, and your practice. So the initial client interview, again, my name is Manny Sarah, happy to help you out. At the end, there'll be a QR code. If you all want to scan it, get in touch with me, I'll be happy to help you out. Um, it's my pleasure. I really, really enjoy this stuff. And I'm very, very passionate about the initial client interview because I believe this is where you can make or break your entire case and your relationship with your client. There's also a lot of bar related um, kind of ethics uh, rules that you want to be on the lookout for. Obviously, as kosher as possible. And we're going to actually step on a landmine. Um, I'm always trying to do things as possible, um, and we'll go over that as we can. So, topic succession, right? Or topics this section, session. Right. Uh, Susan will talk later about slurred speech, I'm sure. And right there, an officer would say that that was a sign of impairment. Um, but as we're going through these, we want to go through information gathering first. In my opinion, it's the key to a great defense. Uh, that gathering is going to be from your client mostly, that initial uh, information, and from what you can find on the court, uh, clerk of court. Remember, these meetings, uh, what this portion is, these meetings are that kind of initial consult with the client. We like to call them strategy sessions. Uh, if you're a public defender, this is a lot of times you're meeting clients at arraignment. Um, I was a public defender uh, many moons ago. Um, so power to you guys out there, uh, but understand that when you're making that first interaction with that client, it's going to be really tough to do all of these steps. Um, so sometimes having a form email of everything I'm about to talk about, if you're a public defender, to be able to send out to your client to fill out and send back to you uh, is probably the best thing to do. I used to have a piece of paper in uh, my judge's courtroom where I would have them sign it and fill it out with some of this information. People thought I was crazy, but now we're running a highly successful, you know, kind of practice with data collection, making sure that we really hear our clients out. And I think everyone should really have a good practice for data collection. Um, so that's the first part. Then we'll be providing education. So I think it's teaching how to really teach your clients about what to expect. Uh, teach them about DUI. When you are educated in life, you make great decisions, right? Or better decisions than if you're uneducated. You don't want to make random guesses and kind of go on a whim. Oh, how do I feel today, right? There's a lot of things you want to go over with your client. Um, so we'll be talking about what we really should be educating them about, especially if they're a first-time offender. Um, setting expectations is the third one. Um, in relationships, they say two um, things are the cause for a breakdown of a relationship. One is a lack of communication, and the second is when expectations don't meet reality. So we want to make sure we set realistic expectations with our client. We don't want to make any guarantees either. And then finally, I'll discuss the DMV because during your initial consult with the client, if the arrest happened within 10 days, uh, or excuse me, if the consultation happens within 10 days of arrest, there are some options that your client's going to need to know about. That's probably the most kind of, um, has the most minutiae on that slide. Um, you can Google it, you can review it, you can email me about it if, if we didn't get a full understanding of the rule, because it can be a little bit complicated, but just understand that there is some built-in urgency um, for a defendant after they've been charged with a DUI or received a DUI ticket. Information gathering, what we talked about, okay? So this actually starts before you meet the client. So, right, a client calls, he wants to have a consultation at 3 p.m., the call was taken at night or in the morning, you set it up, so what do you do next? 
Uh, so in some form or fashion, right, I want to try to get my client an intake form or a client questionnaire or a PNC questionnaire. PNC is potential new client questionnaire to review and, and see if we can collect data that will help give us a framework of how we need to craft this customized strategy of defense for our client or really kind of the, the pain points that we may be looking into when they do come and meet with us. So for instance, uh, we want to know their contact information and emergency contact because God forbid, right, they can't make it and uh, maybe there's a pretrial warrant that they don't know about. We want to be able to reach out to an emergency contact and go, hey, um, so-and-so, I, 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 have you gotten in touch with them? We haven't heard from them. Um, we want to have uh, kind of a brief description of the facts, uh, see what they um, are alleging had occurred. There, I went into the previous criminal history. That will be very, very important for if you're in a county that does diversion programs for DUI. Prior DUIs, because as the statute says, you know, your first, second, third, fourth, and so on, DUI has statutory minimum conditions that will apply to uh, specific PNCs. So you want to know which number DUI this is for them. Also, this can count as a strike. And if you are familiar with the strike rule, um, if you have three DWLSs or DUIs, things of that nature, those strikes on your driving privilege, you can have your license revoked. So you kind of want to know that too going into that meeting so you can explain the urgency or importance of this because um, this is not just a DUI. Uh, DUIs can be really, really complicated, really expensive, uh, have the FR44 insurance be applied to a, to a person and really kind of mess up someone's way of life because their car could be taken away. Uh, we also want to know about the immigration status, right? We want to tell our clients we're not immigration lawyers. Right? I think I have something else later on in the slide about that. But and I would have a you know a group of immigration lawyers that you trust and know and, and are reliable to provide or refer your clients to if they have immigration issues because you never know um, what you don't know, right? You don't know your blind spots. And the worst thing you want to do is just guess or say, oh, I heard from someone or I was taught at the public defender that it's no big deal for a DUI or someone told me it's you know, you're going to get deported, let, let us stay in our lanes, right? Uh, let, let, and I'm sure Susan will talk about failure to maintain single lane later as a um, basis for a stop. So let's stay in our lanes with our clients. Let's focus on what we know, um, the experts at DUI, and let other um, lawyers handle the other uh, parts of law. Don't try to be a hero. Uh, and we want to know, are they currently on pretrial release, right? What are their bond conditions? So if someone comes into you and goes, hey, you know, I, I just got to call, I keep having to call this person. Do I have to call them? Don't say, I don't know, we'll find out later. Let's look ahead, because a lot of times the pretrial release conditions are online and you can see what the terms of release are um, and you can help walk them through what is expected of them. So that information gathering. First things first, let the PNC know that your conversations are governed by attorney-client privilege since they are coming to you for legal advice. However, caveat, try to do a conflict check as soon as you possibly can. Um, I know uh, if smaller firms just starting out, it isn't that big of a deal, but as your case counts continue, as your career grows, you're going to have established relationships with witnesses, with officers, uh, with clients. Um, they, all of these things, judges, you, you know, there are, there are certain things that you need to really start to be on the lookout for as that web of contacts and relationships grows and have a plan in play or a tool in play or method in play to run conflict checks to ensure that you're not entering or engaging into a case that you're gonna to have to withdraw from and potentially have an ethical violation. However, you do wanna let the clients know that it's governed by attorney-client privilege because a lot of the times, and uh, I like to use the analogy of, look, it's like talking to a doctor. If you have a awful shoulder and you tell the doctor, oh, my back hurts, but shoulder's fine, it's okay. And you know, they go, when I do this, does that hurt? And you say, no, and really you're feeling that pain up your arm. You're not doing yourself any good. The doctor's going to misdiagnose you, and this is going to be, you know, compounding uh, pain and hurt to your body when it could have probably been prevented, right? They say that ounce of prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure. So tell your client it's okay to be honest. You know, it's okay. We're not here to judge. We're here to help. And make sure they understand that they can be honest with you. So uh, the draw is not mine, but the slice is. Um, so as anyone who knows or plays golf, I like to use golf as an analogy um, because I try to play it even though I'm very poor at it. Um, also, you can look at kind of a rocket ship when a rocket ship takes off. That initial launch point, right, a little tweak left or a little tweak right, right, forward, back can really, really, you know, change where the landing's and it's that small little change. So if we get information 
that um, we about, let's just say, a client has a medical history uh, of, of arthritis in his knee. If we don't get that at the data collection point, right, and we just go on that straight and narrow, that straight line, go in that normal DUI, you know, let's, let's get the reports, let's get the um, dash camera, let's get the body camera, let's get as much as we can, let's look for some legal loopholes, uh, let's look for constitutional violations, let's make some negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, without fully, fully knowing that the performance on the exercises, uh, the field sobriety exercises that you're watching on a video later on or reading in the report, are the way they are because my client's normal faculties are not the same as your normal faculties or LeBron James's normal faculties. Why? Because he's got arthritis in his knee and we could do some data collection and get some medical records and provide them to the state attorney or even present them at, at a motion or trial if needed uh, to explain some of the performance of field sobriety exercises. And that all starts an information gathering. That way you can end up in a position that you want to at the end with a defense uh, that the reason my client performed this way on field sobriety exercises was because of this medical condition. And that's just one of the, you know, very many ways that information gathering can change the way uh, you defend your case, right? We can talk about uh, accents, we can talk about concussions, we can talk about many, many, many things um, that may change um, that normal faculty standard in DUI to be more uh, customized and complicit with your client's normal faculties. And you have to really paint that picture. I don't say certainly, but most times the officer doesn't do your client the favor of a full and complete thorough investigation into, into those injuries. Although sometimes they ask. So, like I said, injuries and physical conditions are imperative to collect those because if someone has, you know, um, a problem with their eyes, that pen test, right, they're doing their horizontal gaze nystagmus or vertical gaze nystagmus test, they may perform a bit differently than someone else. And there's medical explanations to this. I'm not a doctor and certainly the officer is not a doctor. But if my client does have a doctor, let's get those documents and, and, and medical history that we can provide that will leave an objective in the past, right? It's always better if they're in the past or condition at the time of this incident that was not fully accounted for in the totality of the circumstances of Officer Smith arresting my client, um, Mr. Brown, and now all of a sudden we're in court and new things are coming out and the officer didn't know about these because he didn't do a complete and thorough investigation or maybe my client was a little nervous uh, to speak with the officer. What else? Speech impediments we talked about, language barriers. Down here in South Florida, there's tons of language barriers. My family's Hispanic. Not the same as a lot of the folks I spoke up with in Gainesville when I was in college, right? Everyone has different cultural, different accents, um, the way that they say a specific word. And speech impediments are something that uh, officers fail to ask about all the time. And they're really, really common. People actually have some speech impediments that they may not even know of. But uh, an officer certainly isn't going to be the one that diagnoses those on scene. What about a learning disability, right? Uh, I love, uh, it was told many a times that you don't want teachers on a jury. To me, I love teachers on a jury because, especially for DUIs, um, because a teacher knows in school when they tell someone, hey, Johnny, make sure you don't throw uh, the green, uh, excuse me, paper into the green trash can, put it in the blue trash can. They know that, you know, or they're teaching a lesson on, you know, colonial America. On first go, students don't remember everything. Just because you told them once doesn't mean they're going to remember or do it correctly. And a lot of times the field sobriety exercises when an officer is saying, I need you to stand on one, uh, right foot in front of your left, arms by your side, stay in the starting position until I tell you to begin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're getting this slew of 15 different kind of things they need to do. They may, their head may get a little spinny. And even in a, you know, even the smartest people in the world and, and kind of most locked in people may need a second or third instruction to go, wait, wait, what did you say again? And sometimes clients are too nervous to say that. So it's not just learning disabilities, but also learning curves. Uh, make sure you kind of talk to your client about that. Um, ask where they're coming from and where they're going to. Why? What if we can find receipts or documentation or, or other witnesses that say, hey, I was with, um, you know, I was with Mr. Sarah and two hours before at dinner, he only had one old fashioned and that was all I saw. At least it shows that And if we were painting a picture, how do, what's the next thing on that timeline we can establish to really paint a picture of how many drinks did we consume? How much did we consume? How quickly did we consume? What did we consume? When did we last eat, 
who can who saw you last who knows your normal faculties better than a random officer right a stranger so those are all things we want to do to see where they're coming from and going to um, again that kind of falls right into the defense witnesses and exhibits those are important um, those are things that um, especially during a plea if you get you never filling out a plea paperwork they're always talking about there's always language in there about defense witnesses and we have a right to call witnesses on your behalf or cross-examine those called on the state attorney uh, we need to make sure if there's some witnesses we at least collect their name and talk to them right it's your obligation it's their life you want to make sure we want to do what's best for them it's a little more work for us but that's okay right we want to overturn every stone to beat our cases or get a great result um and remember there's much more that you're not going to get from the state attorney's discovery so there's a lot of things your client may have, such as the medical documentation, receipts, um, defense witnesses, uh, problems with their car. Uh, maybe there's some security footage at some particular location. These are all things you want to make sure you look out for in your case. And this all happens before you even enter into a courtroom, right? This is a, from the initial consult. You're setting your case up for success. Also, what do we want to know? Their profession. Why is that important? Because different professions value the outcome of this case on different levels, right? Uh, what if your client is a uh, commercial driver, has a commercial driver's license, a CDL? This is a huge case for him, right? A massive case. What if he drives for Uber for a living, right? These are all things. Needs to drive his kids to school and then to work and then is a personal chauffeur. Uh, drives or transports alcohol uh, back and forth. There could be some conditions of no alcohol and some on some releases. So understand that we need to know the profession because we need to know kind of how important this can be, not just the next five, six, 10 months, but five, six, 10 years, 20 years, right down the line. And it's important to let them know that we're not employment lawyers, right? We're not um, professional. And if you have a contact or kind of a lawyer, professional lawyers, but profession lawyers, and someone in that realm, if they need it, you know, establish a good relationship with referral partners so that you can know and trust these people when referring clients there because you're really going to want them to get good advice and not just kind of been sent to someone who's, you know, um, not doing a good enough job or keeping your client's best interest in mind. Um, because there are unfortunately a lot of times with nurses and, and uh, people that work in um, hospitals, they do those quarterly background checks, at least sometimes that we've seen where it's going to pop up eventually. And um, you want your client to be prepared for that. And there may be a lot of questions involving uh, their profession when you're speaking to them. Um, where, where they see themselves in 5, 10, 20 years. I know that there are certain uh, HOAs or condominium associations that will not allow for someone with a DUI on their record to live in that community. They're very strict. Um, we've had to write some letters to particular uh, HOAs or condominium associations to ask for special permission for our client to uh, live within the community. And an alternative, if they already live in the community, they may have to have a hearing um, in front of the HOA. I know that sounds awful, right? Um, but just be on the lookout for some of that. Do they have any priors, right? Be on the lookout for that second DUI. If this is you know, five years is the one you see most common. Um, and that one has some very strict statutorily man, minimum mandatory sentences that go along with it. Um, so make sure you know that. And, and your client may sometimes forget, I don't know if it's my first or a second. I don't know what happened to this one. Take your time, gather as much information as you can um, and, and give him and honest with you her the permission to speak true to speak open there is no judgment here and you really really need to know um, the outcome of those cases and sometimes you're gonna have to go onto a county or a state that you're not familiar with on their clerk of court website and try to search through there and piece together as much as you can but don't be afraid to be honest with them and go look I need to look into this a little bit more because um, I need to know what this really is for you we don't know this right now uh, you can eventually get the criminal history from the state attorney um, or the offer from the state attorney but at this time you know it's kind of important that you take that extra step to try to help your client out as best you can um how open are they right what what do they want to see happen there are certain clients and you guys i'm sure know about them even if it's a young career of hey i'm going to try no matter what but i'm not taking a plea okay then you've got that i want a speedy trial type of client you got to talk with them about you know the pros and cons of that you have other clients who are so trial averse you know and the last thing they will do is is do anything that would risk an offer that has probation and no jail on it and you want to be delicate with them and understand that this is a process and, and make sure you don't do anything that's going to jeopardize an offer that is acceptable to your client. And now I know it's a little early to kind of gather that information, but most times when you meet with a client, they're going to have an idea of what's acceptable to them. And you can kind of work on that and, and establish those expectations as well. 
um, would they be interested in that diversion program, right? Many diversion programs result in that reckless driving or, or sometimes you, know, you can even get a careless driving out of it. Understand you want to explain to them the difference between you know, being convicted of a DUI and getting a withhold of adjudication on a reckless driving. One can be summary conviction, you're gonna to have to spend for the, HR, uh, the FR44 insurance. So there's a lot that goes into the, the, this client meeting and you wanna show that knowledge so your client can really um, feel that you're looking out for their best interest and you know what you're talking about. Don't and, and, and bolster yourself, right? Let, let the client know that you're here to help and you know what you're doing, you're an authority on this um, because clients need that in life. They don't, they don't need another you know, lawyer down the street that's just gonna please someone out. No, like let, let's be better than that. Um, and you wanna know if they're a citizen. I, I said that before, right? You wanna check with immigration lawyers um, to see what the consequences could be, get their status. So providing education, again, I was just touching on that. You want the, pub, uh, the PNC, you want the potential new client to walk out of your consult with the feeling that you're an authority on DUI, you know case issues, and then you have an intimate knowledge of the court system. This starts before you step into the meeting or Zoom meeting with the PNC. How do you do that? Pull as much information from the clerk as you possibly can. So that is what county is it in, what judges in front of, what state attorneys may be in that division. What do the pretrial release conditions look like? What are the judge's policies and procedures? Have you had cases in this courtroom before, with this prosecutor before, with these facts before, with the arresting officer in the past? If you are uh, in a location that has DUI task force or DUI officers, you're gonna see certain officers come across your desk over and over and over and over again. What if you can compare the reports and show how they are truly a copy and pasted report or one of those um, you know, autogen documents? And you can catch an officer and writing the same thing over and over again. Um, not to say that that's going to beat your case, but it shows that, look, we've dealt with him before. If you have some deposition transcripts, don't be afraid to share with your client how the officer is likely to testify. No guarantees. You're not providing the legal advice there. You're just saying, this is what we've experienced in the past with this officer. Um, and don't forget to review the pretrial paperwork and bond paperwork. I said that earlier. It's really important that you don't... Um, Tell a client he doesn't have to do X, Y, or Z when he really has to do X, Y, or Z, and then he gets a warrant for his arrest. That ain't good. So make sure you talk to them about that. Walk them through it. From one of my favorite movies of all time, um, a little indie movie, 500 Days of Summer. Uh, on the left side, right, uh, is um, the guy and the girl. They are together at dinner. Lowe's, and he's a tumultuous relationship that you know was went through its highs and was trying to get her back and he goes to this party she knows she's gonna he knows she's gonna be there very romantic um and he's walking up the steps and during the movie they're showing both of these scenes at the same time the expectations on the left or on i guess on your screen yeah and reality on the right and as he's walking up he's got like a bottle of wine or a present from her he's imagining he's gonna walk in she's gonna give him a big hug and a kiss they're gonna smile uh, you know, they're going to have this intimate, re, you know, kind of uh, chemistry. He's going to walk her. Around. That's what his expectations are. And it's kind of going through his head. But then in reality, what happens, right? The whole time they have that awkward friend hug, right? Uh, with friends with benefits type uh, thing. Not even just friends at this point, right? With that awkward hug. Um, she's talking with another guy. She introduces the other guy to uh, the gentleman who's sitting with her at the table. I forget his name. He was in Batman. Uh, something Levitt. it. Um, Sorry, I'm showing my ignorance of the whole thing, but the movie's fantastic. And I don't want your client ending up in that reality on the right when you're setting expectations the way on the left, where the expectations that this is going to be a great reunion and a, a great relationship and we're back and it's romantic and beautiful and amazing. And then you get that awkward, you know, just friends hug. You're sitting alone and you're getting introduced to some new guy she's talking to or whatever it may be. It's a really, really good scene. I can't play it because of copyright issues or else I would. Um, so check it out if you want. Um, if not, just think I'm, you know, have a poor taste in in, uh, in cinema. So when we're setting those expectations and we're peeking behind the curtain, make sure you talk to sometimes clients think these are going to be done in 30 days. Uh, sometimes they think these would be three years, right? We can continue this. No, right? Uh, every jurisdiction is different, obviously. But you want to make sure that you establish the expectation of how long it generally takes, um, how long until we get discovery, right? After they file 
uh, their information within 15 days, the state attorney is obligated to give us our, their discovery if we file our demand, and then we can file motions to compel, let them know and what we're likely to get, how quickly it's there, um, and what value it is, and then set up when we're going to talk about it, right? Your lawyer is going to speak to you after we get the um, discovery, it's going to be sent over to you, and we're going to set up a call to discuss it and go over it and any questions you have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's when we're going to talk again. We could talk about whenever that is, right after they sign up with you or after you meet them in court if you're a public defender. Uh, what happens next, right? Talk to them. Make sure you establish a plan. You don't ever want to go to a doctor. You see a doctor and then they just kind of send you on your way. You always want that follow-up visit there because you should be doing something unless you're entirely cured. And we know our clients aren't normally entirely cured after one meeting, unfortunately. Um, let them know, right? When are we going to go to court? What is court like? If you have a waiver of appearance so the client doesn't have to go to court, you can go on his or her behalf. Amazing. Explain that to them. Uh, if your client needs to be there, tell them that. Keep it real. Don't tell them what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. Um, that's super important. Um, and I don't want anyone, and I talked to a lot of young lawyers about this, giving a percentage of chances you can beat my case. Right? That's a dangerous, slippery slope. Um, you know, that I just I, I don't recommend that. I really, really don't. Um, I think it's really setting unreasonable expectations. Every case is so very different. You can tell them about previous cases you've had similar to theirs, um, but you also have to let them know that you need to do the work first, right? You're not even looking at the MRI or the x-ray of the case yet. You've just kind of looked at the body of the case. You haven't gotten depositions if you're in a certain county that allows for depositions on a, on a misdemeanor. You haven't reviewed the reports. You haven't re all of the reports. You haven't reviewed the narrative. Uh, you haven't looked at the body camera. You haven't looked at the dash camera. You haven't taken the DMV formal review yet if you opt to do that. Uh, you haven't pulled the CAD report um, or the 911 call if there is. You haven't spoken to independent witnesses. Understand right, that there's a lot to do and tell the client there's a lot to do. Um, and we're willing to do it. It's just be patient with us and here's our plan. Um, finally, let them know this is not a movie, okay? But it wasn't realistic, was it? Um, Suits was a great show some years ago that I loved whatsoever, right? A Few Good Men is a fantastic, fantastic movie. If you've ever seen that, that's what clients expect to see in court. Theatrics, you dressed all the way in your Gucci suit, right? You there screaming at the prosecutor and, you know, the judge, uh, you know, having some theatrical moment up there. When really a calendar call, you or a disco or a status, you're walking in, you're speaking, it may take a grand total of two minutes and are perplexed by that idea and think you're a lazy lawyer or think you're not doing your job or you didn't even tell the judge what happened. So you wanna manage those expectations and let them know how these court cases go, um, how hearings go, what they mean, what they wanna testify at a motion or a trial. And most times they won't be speaking and they shouldn't be speaking, right? We wanna protect them. Um, so I can't stress enough that clients think that this is gonna be, and you may not think so, but they do. Trust me, we've, we've talked to them. They think this is going to be some, you know, big uh, movie type of uh, experience for them when really, as we all know, it's kind of mundane and monotonous until it gets hot. The DMV rule. So as I said, so one of the things you want to collect from a client is their D. They will buy tickets. So once they're arrested, um, then get bonded out. And when they are released from custody, they'll have in their uh, property or from the jail, their, the DUI ticket from the officer. Their license will be taken away and they'll have a ticket in most cases. On that ticket, we'll have, you can actually see some really important information. You can see the arresting officer. Uh, one of the other tickets may have the reason for the stop of the vehicle. If they're uh, listed on there, uh, we'll get in more of the breast samples later, very important. Um, if it's a refusal, they may have a refusal on there. And then they'll have eligible for permit checked off or not. Sometimes officers don't know what they're doing or, or maybe make a clerical error and check it off if, if they are eligible, saying they're eligible for a permit and they're not, or saying they're not eligible for a permit and they actually are. Um, a lot of the times you want to really look into that. That check doesn't really mean the world to me. I, it does provide some information, but we want to look into it a little bit further to see what's going on. Um, but truly going on. But that ticket will, they can then do two things during that time. One, they can say, I'd like to do a formal review or waive a formal review. And what is a formal review? 
One review is a hearing with the DMV that is provided uh, presided over typically not by a lawyer, judge, or magistrate, but an employee of the DMV most times. Um, and that employee of the DMV will decide a fact. Um, they're going to decide what comes in and what's not, what's relevant and what's not. Uh, most times now they're done over the phone. Prior to COVID, you would actually kind of go into the office and and uh, argue them. So the officer can appear, and there'll be a little audio recording. I don't have it here, but we used to have one of the little, you click it, and it starts recording audio. And the hearing officer typically does that and records the conversation that you're having or cross-examination that you're having uh, with the officer if you subpoena them to be there. That's like a free deposition, guys. Um, yeah, it's not free because there's some costs associated with it. Uh, with the DM, does not allow. But at a particular time, right? If you're in a jurisdiction that offer depositions, this is an opportunity to question that officer and cross-examine them and get a record of it. Um, so there are times where I, I think that it's actually best to do the DMV a hearing for the purposes of the case itself, the criminal case. Um, however, at that hearing, the hearing officer is going to decide whether there was a valid arrest and then whether a few other things but mostly whether a valid breath sample was provided and it was over the legal limit or whether a client uh, refused the breath sample after being read their implied consent you want to attack the uh, breath machine itself refusal after implied consent was read so all of these things are, are what you challenge at the dmv it's a preponderance of the evidence standard uh, to win this hearing. You don't typically win them much. There's a lot of really good appellate issues that come from these. If you kind of look at our case law, you'll see a lot of it. But understand mostly in these hearings, um, information gathering in, is, is very valuable where you're going to be able to question the officer. Uh, but during that hearing, if you were to lose, to elect to do, so that's the hearing, pardon me. Um, and then within seven business days after the hearing, they'll let you know uh, whether you win or lose the hearing. Um, so prior to doing that, you want to know, hey, client, you know, Mr. Smith, I need to know this is really subjective. It's up to you how you want to make this decision. I can advise one way or the other, the pros and cons. Um, but again, it's your license. It's your life. It's your employment. It's your kids. It's your family, whatever it may be that they need the license to support. Um, so here's what happens. Um, let me see. Do I go forward or back for this one? All right. So yeah, there's the 10 day, uh, 10 day rule that I spoke about. Those are some of the greatest dunkers of all time. We're missing, uh, missing Vince Carter on there. Um, there's the statute. Uh, you have 10 days to do this. So here's the suspension. And here's kind of what happens. So if you do not want to do the formal review, you say, I need a hardship license ASAP. Then you have an option to waive the formal review if this is your first UI arrest. And if you send in some paperwork to DMV to waive the formal review and you enroll in a DUI school, you will be eligible for that hardship license. Um, and you don't have to have a quote unquote hard suspension of your license. Now, your license is still going to be suspended if you refuse a breath sample for 12 months. And if you provided a breath sample on scene, even if it's double the legal limit, it will be suspended for six months. That's with the DMV. The court can resuspend your license, right? So it's not like you get gain time for the license that was suspended after arrest by the DMV, unfortunately. Um, and you have to have that conversation with clients. But at that particular time, right, if you're waiving that form of view and you want your hardship license right away, it'll drive school, work, religious purposes, um, what was the other, uh, for like groceries, things of that nature. However, by waiving the formal review, you are admitting to that DUI being on your driving record. And you're going to have to do that DUI school if you want the hardship. If you challenge the formal review, and let's do the first one, right? If you refuse the breath sample, you're facing that 12 month suspension. So you're trying to beat the 12 month suspension. You win that formal review, your license is not suspended by the DMV. However, if you lose that formal review, your license is then suspended for 90 days hard, meaning no driving, three months or so, no driving whatsoever. So for 90 days, there's no hardship. There's nothing. You got to Uber around. You got to have a family member drop you off. You got to take the bus, et cetera, et cetera. And so understand that there's a risk to this. Now you're kind of seeing, right, why some people elect to waive the form review and get their hardship license right away. Others who are a little bit more risk tolerant or care more about the criminal case 
who want that testimony from the officer are willing to take that risk. If the officer doesn't show up, I forgot to mention this before I get on to the, uh, if you did provide a breast sample, if the officer doesn't show up to the hearing, you can win, right? Uh, so long as he was properly subpoenaed to be there, you can win the formal review. Um, and there are times where the officer just doesn't show up. It's fantastic. You win. Um, so that is something to discuss with the client as well. It's not, it's happened more and more frequently, actually, to be quite frank, uh, after COVID. But prior to COVID, the officers were usually showing up. I don't know kind of what correlates. Test, uh, and you blew above the legal limit. Uh, again, it doesn't matter if you blew a 0 0.16, 0 0.22, point whatever. If it's above the legal limit and you provide a breast sample, you are facing a six months driver's license suspension. And if you lose the formal review, that six month suspension is there, but you also have a 30 day hard suspension, no driving. Same as that 90 day above, but obviously a bit more lenient with 30 days. This is the one time where you get kind of rewarded for providing the same procedure as above, um, where you have to have the formal review. And if you lose the formal review, the suspension will then start. Um, after the formal review uh, order is issued. So it's a bit complicated. Um, it's very simply put, if you read it the way I wrote it, I just decided to kind of expound on some things. If you have any further questions about it, you know, I think we have some YouTube videos, you can Google it um, or email me. I'll be happy to speak with you about it. Understand that there are certain notices you have to provide to the state attorney. And there's a lot we when you're these uh, formal reviews as well. So like I said, we can get into is if it's your second DUI, you're likely not going to review. Uh, you're going to have to do the formal review hearing depending on some things. Again, I don't have enough time, unfortunately, to get into all of that. Um, but um, again, I hope this helped. Stay in touch. Okay. So I care tremendously about education, both clients, um, but also young lawyers or any lawyers around. Uh, I was provided a lot of education through my mentors, who I still keep in touch with, who actually just yesterday, there was a big uh, issue on a case I was trying to figure out. I called a few people and it was amazing to have people I trust, some not even in our jurisdiction. Um, don't be afraid to call or reach out. I'm, there's no judgment here. There are no dumb questions. Um, I'm here to help, not hurt. Again, my name is Attorney Manny Sarah. I hope you enjoy the remaining uh, sessions of this. Um, always put your client's best interest first and don't be afraid to tell them what they need to hear. Don't tell them just what they want to hear. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Lawson. I'm one of the partners here at the Rossin Law Firm and also a board certified criminal trial attorney. And today we're going to, in my portion, we're gonna talk about how to issue spot and work a DUI case pre-trial, as well as discuss a very, very, maybe dry, but very important issue of DUI motion. So when you get the discovery for a DUI case, it's very important to review and gather um, all the important information. And this is by no means a, um, an exhaustive list, uh, but some things, and I'm gonna go through some things that I, that I didn't even include on here. So the first thing you should look at is the probable cause affidavit. Um, in every county, it, there, it's called different things. For example, in Miami-Dade County, it's called the A form, but really the police report and the narrative police report that show uh, and explain what the police officer wrote down that, that their observations that happened. Now, when you're reviewing the probable cause affidavit and the narrative, there may be some police officers that are listed in the narrative or the probable cause affidavit that are not on the witness list. And it's important to take note of who these officers are because by being listed in discovery, even if they're not on the witness list, you're deemed to be uh, a notice about these witnesses. So you can't later claim a Richardson violation or that you did not know about these witnesses. And this happens all the time. So it's important to notate all the details in the probable cause and narrative and read it very, very carefully. A lot of times I'll even do an outline outlining the issues I see, the different, there's different officers, what role each officer played uh, when going through the probable cause affidavit and the narrative. So in addition to when we say narrative, that's basically supplemental reports. So 
Some officers do narratives and supplemental reports, others don't, but it's important to figure out what everyone's role was and who did what. Something else that's very important, especially in DUI cases, are the tickets. So obviously you have the DUI ticket, which initially the DUI ticket for the first 10 days until someone decides if they want to uh, elect to have a formal review hearing with the DMV or waive a formal review hearing, that DMV, that ticket um, is their driver's license. But it's really important, you know there's gonna be a DUI ticket, but to look for the other tickets. Um, to see what traffic, if any, what traffic citation tickets someone was issued, right? Because that tells a lot about the stop. So if they're alleging, they, if officers are alleging they stopped your client for speeding, did they write a speeding citation? So it's very important to get those tickets as, as a part of when you're reviewing and gathering discovery. Something else that's very important. Uh, and a lot of times the state provides it. They don't always provide it. So if not, you could always try to get it on your own. But you want to know your DMV driving record, right? So Manny is going to talk about uh, it, initially gathering the information from your client. But sometimes clients don't know, you know, this might not be their first DUI. And they might not know when their first DUI happened. So by getting someone's DMV driving record, we can gather that information because it's very important to know that information. If this is someone's second DUI and it's inside five years, so meaning this is the second one within five years, there's a mandatory 10 days in jail. So it's a very important to know if uh, this is a second within five or a second outside of five. Additionally, if this is someone's third DUI, within 10 years that could that this a lot of times the state files that as a felony whereas opposed if it's outside 10 years that's a misdemeanor so th these are all really important things that you need to know in the discovery process so getting your client's dmv driving record is really important so and the most uh, something that's really important that isn't on this list and again by previously said by no means is this list exhaustive but body worn cameras so most police agencies now have body worn cameras here in south florida um, almost every agency has except for with the exception i believe of hollywood police department and davie police department down here um, but you will see when you're reviewing the probable cause affidavit and the narrative it'll say say B, bwc worn so BWC WARN stands for Body Worn Camera. And if you see that, you need to make sure you get that. So, you know, we spend a lot of time at our firm really going through the discovery. And it's really, really critical to review any piece of digital evidence, those body worn cameras. In addition um, to the cameras that will be on scene, a lot of times you also get um, video of your client being transported. And even though it's they're long videos sometimes, uh, it's very important to watch because you don't want to miss, you know, something very important your client might have stated in the back of that police car. So it's important to make sure you have all the digital evidence, including the body worn cameras. Uh, Florida Highway Patrol, they don't have body worn cameras. However, they have uh, dash cam or, or digital cameras so you can see uh, when some, when they're having an encounter outside of their vehicle with your client, you could see that encounter and they have audio too. So you can also hear that encounter. And we found a lot of times in our cases, we have had great results by finding the things in those, in that digital evidence in the body worn cameras. So, and a lot of times we'll get the discovery and we'll have, you know, one officer's body camera. And then I realized, wait, there should be body camera this officer too. So we'll have to follow up and, and request it and if not file a motion to compel to get that. So body worn cameras, especially in DUI cases are critical and a really important part of reviewing and gathering your discovery. Now, the next thing on the list is medical reports, if any. So a lot of times the police officers in these cases uh, will transport your client um, to a hospital prior to transporting them to jail. They claim that 
you know, a lot of times that this is for medical clearance prior to them taking to the jail. But it's very important to get those medical reports because if testing um, was done, there's observations that are notated a lot of times in medical reports. Certainly if, you know, urine or blood was taken, which we're gonna get to in a second, we need to know, and so we, we want those medical reports. A lot of times, if it's a crash uh, case, there will be you know, fire rescue that ar arrives on scene, and they will generate reports, the fire rescue will. So we want all those reports. We want the re medical reports, fire rescue reports. So be, be cognizant of, if you see that you're, this was an accident in particular, but if you see your client was transported, you want those to request those additional reports if they weren't provided. Breath results, if any, along with agency inspections. So a lot of times in this, our discovery, we'll get the breath results. It'll be, you know, a piece of paper stating the intoxilizer number um, and the result, the breath results. There's so much more uh, that you want to look into, and I could go on for a long time uh, about breath results and and breath tests. However. You want to make sure you have the breath results. And additionally, uh, you want to make sure that FDLE has a great website where you can pull and, and look at those uh, inspection reports because a lot of times you could attack the breath if the intoxilizer has failed, um, there's been issues with it. So breath results along with, I would add, the agency inspection report, which is done by the breath tech operator, and you wanna follow up and also get, uh, I would go on the FDLE website because there's great information on there. Urine, blood, I just mentioned, if any, uh, this is really important too. A lot of times the state makes a mistake and they do not list the person who took your client's urine or blood as an expert. And in order them for them to be able to testify, about the results of the urine or blood, the state must list them as an expert. And they don't always know that, they mess up on that a lot. So it's important to take note um, of that. So these are just uh, a list of things to look for when you're reviewing and you're gathering your discovery to build your defense and get to the next portion, uh, which is the DUI motion. So DUI motion. Do or do not, okay, first one, traffic stops. Very, very important. So for traffic stops, right? So we were just talking about um, to look at the tickets and that can provide uh, information as to what your client was stopped for. But an officer, this has to have probable cause to believe a traffic violation occurred, okay? This is not reasonable suspicion. To stop your client, the officer has to have probable cause. So it's, again, it's very important to look at what was the reason for the stop. And we're gonna get into uh, the different reasons that officers st could stop your client, but it's really, really, this is not um, a, a subjective, so by, this is not a subjective by the officer. The, the validity of a traffic stop is judged on an objective basis. So the officer's knowledge, motivation, intention is wholly irrelevant. And we cited to the two cases, Heard and Holland. So it's very important for traffic stops to first know that they need, an officer needs probable cause and that it's judged on an objective, not a subjective basis. So we call the first, the first kind of cases you see a lot in, in DUIs. Oops. Hold on, I clicked something. Okay, sorry. The first, the first kind of uh, stop we see a lot in DUIs are called uh, failure to maintain uh, a, a single lane, right? So we refer to them a lot of times as weaving cases. But uh, when people see, see someone failing to maintain a single lane or weaving within the lane, that could be a possible um, sign that someone may be under the influence. 
So, but don't be discouraged by seeing um, a weaving or, or your client failing to maintain a single lean that that is, oh no, that that's a bad thing. It's not always, we've had great results in cases um, with the same situation. So we've listed cases here that say the critical factor, um, there needs to be more than just failing to maintain a single lane. So it's, the, the, it has to be failing to maintain a single lane and impeding um, traffic. So, and we've, that's what these cases say. Other cases holding the crit critical factor for determining PC for maintaining a single lane is whether the vehicle is driving um, you know, erratically, irregularly, or endangering other vehicles. And it's a lot of, and, and our motions, we are in the 17th judicial circuit. So we use cases from our circuit to cite to. Certainly we use, you know, Florida Supreme Court DCA cases as well, like heard, but it's really good to cite to the 17th or whatever circuit you are in. Other notable decisions about driving patterns. Here's some more really good cases. Um, we have Crooks, which is a great case that says, two or three occasions of moving slightly over a lane without creating a reasonable uh, safety concern is, is inadequate to justify a stop. Okay, and then the next case of Alford, courts have held a stop to be invalid when a vehicle moves and cross the right lane by several inches um, to one foot approximately six to seven times in a weaving pattern. Again, this is, this is another case of saying you need to find out and you need to know, and these are questions that you need to be asking when you take your depositions, is whether the weaving, whether the failure to maintain a single lane was traffic affected, was, tra was traffic impeded by the, the weaving or failure to maintain a single lane. Okay, next, investigative stop. Oops, I did it again. Okay. Okay, so unlike traffic stops, which require, again, the key, word, key is probable cause and objective standards. Unlike traffic stops, um, investigative stops are a little bit different. So they only require reasonable suspicion. So this says police can stop and briefly detain a person for an investigative purposes if the officer has a reasonable suspicion supported by articulable facts that criminal activity may be afoot even if the officer lacks probable cause. So a lot of times you have, you know, you have cases in, in DUIs where um, we've had a lot where our client may be sleeping, fall, fall asleep behind the wheel. Now, sleeping behind the wheel doesn't necessarily mean DUI, but uh, officers use that as a reason to say they're going to do an investigative stop to check to make, to make sure that someone's okay when they're sleeping behind the wheel, that they're not suffering from some sort of uh, medical emergency. So you have to, in, in all of these cases, a really important thing is to look at the totality of the circumstances. So that's why you got to really, when you're reading and going through the, the discovery in your cases, um, really look at those details and the totality of the circumstances is also comes into play throughout um, these cases. So again, investigative stops do not need probable cause. They need reasonable, if they need reasonable suspicion supported by the articulable facts that criminal activity may be afoot. So when, so, when an officer, officer is doing an investigative stop, and this is the Florida statute we cited, 901.151. So it's, it's saying that, again, that an officer may, the key is temporarily detain such person for the purpose of ascertaining the identity of the person. You can't, they could temporarily detain um, to do an investigative stop, okay? 
and and this is we've cited the statute that they could temporarily detain and the circumstances surrounding his presence abroad, which led the officer to believe that he had committed was committed or about to commit a criminal offense. This is a great case, the great case, the Montez Balton case, and this deals with the fellow officer rule. So, and in that case, it's, it deals with a, a blood draw. And the officer, and I really encourage, if you need the site, we can provide it, but I really encourage you to read that case because in that case, the officer that was taking the blood draw did not have knowledge of the facts and circumstances, essentially why they were doing the blood draw. So, um, and they found that the fellow officer rule did not apply in that case. Um, so I threw that in there. I thought that was important. And it's a great case that we use in a lot of our cases. So that's why I added that in there. But back to the investigative stop, reasonable suspicion, like probable cause, is dependent on both the content of information possessed by the police and its degree of reliability. And this is what I was just talking about. Both factors, quantity and quality, are considered in the totality of the circumstances. So when we say totality of circumstances, again, the whole picture. <clears throat> and we have a, it's very important to distinguish, especially when you, when you get, uh, you know, a call. There's a, there's a 911 call stating certain information, with, which ultimately leads to, let's say, a traffic stop. So it's very important to distinguish if someone, the person, the caller, was an anonymous tipster versus it says confidential informant, but really what that mean, it means is a citizen informant. So an anonymous tipster is someone who is just what it sounds like, just anonymous. Whereas a confidential informant or a citizen uh, informant is someone who actually leaves their information, leaves their name, and phone number, we can identify that person. And in Hall v. State, this is a Florida Fourth DCA case. In that case, it, they held that where a citizen informant, okay, someone who left their information, a retail store manager alerted police that appellant and other man were acting suspiciously, but where officer did not observe appellant to do anything suspicious, there was no basis for an investigatory stop. So again, this deals with that the officer um, did not, although this was a citizen informant, the officer did not firsthand observe the uh, defendant to do anything suspicious. So there was, so they were not allowed to base their stop, um, what the citizen informant told them because they did not witness it themselves. So the court held it's a very good case that there was no basis for an investigatory stop. Um, this this next case, the Ellis case, it says a 911 call could be considered by on-duty officer in making an investigatory stop when the caller is a CI, but stopping officer, again, this is the same thing, the stopping officer must make his own observation, okay? So I recently had um, a case where a, it was, it was kind of a debate whether the person was an anonymous tipster or a confidential informant, but nonetheless, police call, are called out, someone potentially causing a disturbance gets in their car, um, and the police stop, stop the vehicle, and they say that's an investigative stop. Our argument is, you know, they did not observe that vehicle commit any, you know, traffic violations and didn't observe the, our client do anything suspicious in their presence. So the argument was, there was no basis for an investigatory stop. So uh, we talk, talk about here, the Department of Highway and Safety Motor Vehicle case, recognizing that a legitimate concern for the safety of the motoring public can warrant a brief investigatory stop, and this is what I was referring to a few minutes ago, to determine whether a driver is ill, tired, or driving under the influence in situations less suspicious than required for other types of criminal behavior. And so this is actually, I don't know why it's there two times, but um, that's what the, that case holds, that an officer um, can make a brief stop to, again, why is this person sleeping? 
are, is it a medical emergency? Are they just tired? So um, that is the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles. And there's also another case cited below that deals with the same issue. Okay, accident report privilege. So a lot of these DUI cases are accident crash cases. And accident report privilege, which we're gonna talk about now, is something that if you have a crash case, a case involving an accident, in every single one of those cases, you should be filing either a motion in limine or a motion to suppress um, any statements regarding the accident. So what does that mean? And we're gonna get, get to it now in detail. So even if you're successful in um, suppressing or keeping the statements out, that doesn't mean that the body-worn camera of your client cannot be played. So it could be played, but it needs to be muted so the statements don't come in. But the officers, keep in mind, can still that, that body-worn camera, the video could still be played and the officers could still testify um, as to their observations, that your client was staggering when they walked, that your client was, uh, speech was blurred, but, they, but the, it keeps those statements that were made regarding the accident out. So, and this is straight from the Florida statute, 316.066, which says, because they, that Florida law places a legal duty and an obligation on an individual in an automobile accident, automobile accident to provide information to law enforcement for the purpose of completing an accident report investigation. So in Florida, this, they want this statute and this law they want people to speak open and honestly about the accident, but they don't want people to incriminate themselves. So that's why they came out with this accident report privilege. Um, and that's what the next thing says. In exchange for providing this potentially incriminating information, the legislator granted immunity to such statements so that it may not be used um, in any criminal or civil proceeding against the defendant. So if your client, as a part of the crash investigation, you know, says, it was my fault, I just had some drinks at the bar, um, you should file, again, any of those statements, you should always file a motion under accident report privilege, under this statute, and we're going to get into the cases like Marshall, which are great to keep those statements out. And, you know, we've had, even though we've, we file motions and we, to suppress and we list a lot of, most of the time in our accident crash cases, accident report privilege is one of the first thing, first issues we raise. You know, we, we've been very successful on sometimes on accident report privilege, but not the other issues. But even just winning that, you may not think it's a huge issue. We've had great results, such as getting a reckless driving um, on a DUI case because of getting these statements out. So motions are, and I should have mentioned this before, motions, filing motions in DUI cases, and in almost every DUI case that we have, we can come up with a legal basis to file a motion. And when we do file the motions, this is how we get our great results. A state attorney is not gonna just take a DUI and look at it and say, okay, we're gonna give you a reckless driving. That's very, very rare a way to get a reckless driving is to file these motions. Okay, so back to accident report privilege. So this says, so to the purpose of, again, an accident report privilege is for people to be open and honest and not feel like what they say about the accident will later turn and be used against them in a criminal or civil case. So accordingly, when an individual in an automobile is suspected of DUI, law enforcement must advise the defendant that investigation is now a criminal investigation. Okay, so crash investigation is done. Most of the time you have a crash, uh, an officer or um, doing, a, doing the crash investigation or a public safety aid person doing the, the crash investigation. And then another officer comes Sometimes it's someone on the DUI task force, if the agency has a DUI task force, comes to do the um, 
criminal or DUI investigation. We always argue that Miranda, defendant's Miranda warnings must be read before any statement may be admitted. And we cite to State v. Evans, State v. Marshall, State v. Nordstrom. Now, there was, is a new case, which if you, you know, feel free to email me, I'll give you all my, all my information at the end. But there is a new case that recently came out this year, so 2023, last month in January, um, State of Florida v. Bender. And it was a case out of our, our circuit. And, you know, it's not the greatest for this, but I would continue to always argue I would review that case, but always, always argue to the judge that um, once a criminal investigation uh, begins, Miranda warnings should be read because a lot of times they are not. <clears throat> and actually the case I was talking about, the new case Bender, cites to a case we use a lot, which is Bender, and some, which Bender summarizes the cases of Nordstrom and Marshall. And it says, we emphasize that the privilege granted under the Florida statute um, applicable if no Miranda Miranda warnings are given. Further, if a law enforcement officer gives any indication uh, to a defendant that that they must respond to questions concerning the investigation of an accident, there must be an express statement by law enforcement officials to the defendant that this is what they're supposed to say. You know, the accident, and the accident portion is now over. This is now a criminal investigation, followed by the Miranda warning in order for any statement to be admitted. Now, this is what I was saying before I got ahead of myself. <clears throat> so if you win, meaning if the statements are um, suppressed, kept out, again, this only mutes the audio portion. Okay. The jury will still see video and hear the officer testifying about their observations. Be prepared for the judge to fight you on whether Miranda w- must be read. And, and again, we argue that it should be read. You got to The judge we will probably fight you on that. And this new case of Bender is going to even cause it more difficult. But again, fight that when the hats are turned, change. So meaning... I forgot to mention that I said that a lot of times, you know, it's a crash investigation, a crash investigation officer, and then it's, and then, then another officer takes over. A lot of times, sometimes it's the same officer who does the crash investigation and the DUI investigation, and they say they're changing hats. Um, so when their hats, when the hats are changed, they need to inform your client that the accident is over, the DUI inv- investigation has begun and read Miranda. So that was uh, accident report privilege. And again, I'm just trying to provide a summary. There's so much more to each one of these um, subcategories we're talking about. Um, And and, uh, if you're not, obviously we're in, as mentioned, we're in the 17th Judicial Circuit. Look for cases that are in your district as well. Um, But next issue is, field sobriety exercises. They're not, although I was in trial recently, maybe not, maybe six months ago, and the state attorney in the trial called them, okay, and that's why we always flip that said their field sobriety test or tried to call them that. One of the things we always put in our motion in limine is they shouldn't, they are not able to call them field sobriety tests. They are not tests. They are exercises. Okay. So what do you need for, what does an officer need to request a person to perform field sobriety exercises? They need reasonable suspicion that the driver operating the vehicle may be under the influence. Okay. And this detention cannot occur. And again, this is a, an objective, not subjective manifestation that the driver is under the influence. Okay. So they need reasonable suspicion. And then we have the objective standard. All right. Field sobriety exercises. There was a case 
in in the 17th Judicial Circuit, and if you need it, feel free to email it was the Marcellus case. Um, and and what it says, what it said, it wasn't a great case for us, but what it says is that to command someone to do uh, field sobriety exercises, you you need reason only reasonable suspicion, okay? That you can't argue command requires probable cause. So you could still argue popple, and that is that involuntary consent because a client, I, we love the popple case, because a client is acquiescent to police authority. And that's a way to get around this um, police only need uh, reasonable suspicion to command your client to um, perform these field sobriety exercises. So in um, State v. Luim, okay, this is another 17th Judicial uh, Circuit case. The court, this is a great case, the court determined that the officer did not have reasonable suspicion necessary to detain defendant for a DUI investigation and request that he perform field sobriety exercises, where officer did not observe impairment in the defendant's driving um, or appearance apart from an odor detected on his person and inside his vehicle. So remember, odor is not enough, right? It's not, I could get, I could have two glasses of wine, get in my car and drive and have the odor of alcohol. Um, that is not the determining factor if someone is driving under the influence because they're, it has to be, their normal faculties have to be impaired. So while the odor of alcohol is certainly a factor to be considered in determining reasonable suspicion, the mere odor of alcohol beverage on someone's breath is not inconsistent with, again, someone being able to operate a motor vehicle that their normal faculties are not impaired. And another great case. So for Tony, another, I've won several motions based on this case. Um, so in Bertoni, the officer asked uh, to perform roadsides and the, the signs of impairment that the officer observed was odor of alcohol, red eyes, flushed face, and a combative attitude, okay? So, but there was no observations of a driving pattern. So, you know, speeding, you know, is not always indicative of impairment and it's not a sign of impairment, but let's, so there was no weaving, there was no traffic violations in Bertoni. Um, they, the reasonable suspicion that the officer in Bertoni used was odor, red eyes, flushed face, and the defendant had an attitude. The court found, held that that was not enough to have, uh, that was not enough reasonable suspicion to ask the defendant to perform these field sobriety exercises. <clears throat> okay, so back to, so voluntary versus involuntary consent, okay? And this is very important when you're watching the body cameras to listen to the words and the language the officer is using towards your client, okay? And again, here we go. Whether consent is voluntary is a question of fact to be considered in the, here we go again, totality of the circumstances. This is Tyson B. State out of the 50 CA. A case that we use a lot that we've been successful in arguing um, that our client was just acquiescent to police authority, thus the field sobriety exercises were not, were not um, voluntary, is this case State v. Lynn. In State v. Lynn, the court held where the language used by an officer in instructing a defendant to perform field sobriety exercises is consistent with the finding that the defendant was acquiescing to um, authority, then the defendant's performance of field to bright exercises was not voluntary, voluntary and evidence should be suppressed. So again, to get around the, you only need reasonable suspicion to command the Marcellus case. We have a case recently that our firm won, um, my partner, Maddie Ross, and she argued, she was successful in arguing that the, her client's what did not voluntarily uh, perform the field sobriety exercises because her client was just acquiescent to a show of authority. 
I have a great motion that I recently filed that I'm really excited to argue that's coming up and it's dealing with the same issue and the language by the officer in this case, you know, my client saying, I'm so nervous. I don't know, do I have to perform these exercises? Um, and the officer is using language like you need to, you have to. So hoping to be successful based on the language that the officer used and taking into account the entire totality of the circumstances. Probable cause. Like, we, like I mentioned that in every case, accident report privilege should be um, raised. Also in motions, it's very important to argue probable cause, okay? Because let's say we are successful in getting the field sobriety exercises um, suppressed, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean the case is good, the entire case is going away. away. But that could lead to the argument that the police did not have probable cause to arrest your client. So speaking of, I wanted to mention, there is a case, Howitt, H-O-W-I-T-T. -T, and again, if you need any of these citations, feel free to email me. It's a great case where, it's a great case where the client, um, refuse to per, refuse to perform these field sobriety exercises um, and in that case the the court found that if the if the officer did not tell the the, the defendant that their failure to perform these field sobriety exercises uh, could be used against them then the state uh, could not argue the consciousness of guilt argument. So I just wanted to forgot, I did, before I forgot, I wanted to mention that it's a new case, it's a great case, um, and I have that coming up to argue, added it to my motion. So here we are, back to probable cause. Okay. No PC for DUI arrest. So you can't arrest based on a refusal. That's what made me think of that case. So the exercises are voluntary and refusal to participate in the exercises is not what subjects the driver to arrest. So probable cause is a great argument, again, to taking into account, again, the totality of the circumstances for everything, um, that the officer did not have enough to even not enough probable cause, remember the probable cause is obviously much higher than reasonable suspicion to effectuate the arrest of your client. So don't forget, don't think just because, oh great, I have this wonderful you know, argument to suppress the field sobriety exercises, I don't need to uh, ar put in the probable cause argument. Definitely put in the probable cause argument into your motion. Now, before we conclude, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple more things, but I wanted to speak about plea or trial meetings that we are very important prior to a motion hearing that we do not just prior to trial. So when you, when you meet with your client, obviously Manny's gonna talk about how the initial information, how important that in initial information is to gather, right? You wanna know. Do they have um, any medical issues which could affect their performance on these field sobriety exercises? Um, you know, different different to know your client, right? That's, that's the goal. But you do not, you also want to have a really, really subsequent sit, sit down meeting with them before this motion, right? So after you take your depositions, <clears throat> But prior to doing the motion, you want to go through their case in entirety with them, right? And go through all of the issues that you plan on raising at the motion hearing. And really important, you want to make sure you go through the discovery with them, okay? You want to show them those body-worn cameras. You want to go over the digital evidence with them because you don't want to be in court at your motion hearing for the first time and them seeing those body-worn cameras. 
right? So that's something that's really important. We highly recommend having a player trial meeting. I also wanted to mention we've had really great success in, you know, speaking of the body camera. So they've really been helpful. And we've argued, used the case, there's a case called Wiggins. And in the Wiggins case, the court found that even if, like we have an officer come take the stand and they, they testify that one of the signs of impairment is that your client was slurring, right? They love to put slurred speech as a sign of impairment. You watch the you watch the body camera and you see your client is speaking just fine. You know, you want, one of the things you want to know obviously is your client is English is your client's first language. Do they speak with an accent? But you review the body cam and there is no slurred speech. So that's another great thing that the Wiggins case holds that by having today in today's world that by having these body cameras, um, if the body camera right contradicts what the officer is testifying to the court can disregard in its entirety the officer's testimony and base their observation on the body camera and find that your client didn't ha in fact have blurred speech right so a lot of in these dui cases we we see we've covered odor of alcohol and again odor of alcohol is not enough you know Bloodshot, watery eyes, many reasons people can have bloodshot, watery eyes. Flushed face, right? Slurred speech, those are the classic things that you see in your DUI cases. Just because you see those, don't be discouraged. Just because you read the probable cause affidavit and are like, oh, this sounds really bad. We promise when you actually go through and break down your client's case, gather the information at the initial interview, take the deposition, get this helpful information, review, obviously before taking the depositions as we talked about earlier, gather the information, review the discovery, attack the issues, you know, no reasonable suspicion to even begin the DUI investigation. Even before that, did they have a reason to stop your client? Um, you know, were these of field sobriety exercises voluntary, right? And then, I mean, there's so much more to go into, you know, then if your client provided breath, were the policies and procedures um, followed regarding breath? Was the 20 minute observation period done correctly? Speaking of, one more thing I forgot to mention as far as um, videos. So a lot, I think mainly Broward Sheriff's Office down here, but they do have videos at the um, breath tech places. So, right, and in breath cases, it's important to know, obviously, was the intoxilizer, was the breath a handheld, or were they taken down to uh, the, normally the Broward Sheriff's Office station to provide a breath sample? And if they were taken there, you will get a video um, I don't know why they don't provide a video of when your client's giving the breath sample, because that would be very helpful. But they, you, you get a lot of times you, we get a video of them reading them implied consent and them asking them those questions, preliminary questions when they're at the station prior to um, giving their breath sample. So that's another video I forgot to mention when we were talking about body worn cameras and digital evidence. That's something that to see, to look for when you're gathering um, your discovery, if that exists. So to wrap up, um, you know, these cases, DUIs, don't be afraid. You know, when I first started doing them, you know, they're, they're, they're great cases to fight File those emotions, um, the case law, you know, go through, gather your discovery, file the motions, and we are confident that as we do, you will have great results. So this is uh, about me. You could scan below to find my contact information. My email is Susan, my first name, at rothandlawfirm.com. Be happy to answer any questions, share any motions, um, and you know any cases that I mentioned that weren't in the slides, but the slides should be available to you so you didn't have to, I should have told you, you don't need to write down any of the, the cases, but 
thank you very much. It was a pleasure um, and keep in touch. Hi everybody, I'm Adam Rossin from the Rossin Law Firm and today my portion of this uh, DUI CLE program is going to be about the uh, basics of DUI science and the standardized field sobriety exercises. And these are two very important parts of DUI cases, in my opinion, some of the most important parts. So it's, it's my pleasure to really, um, you know, take you guys through this. So first, we're going to start really with the standard field sobriety exercises, the SFEs, the SFSEs, whatever you want to call them. That's really going to be the first half. And then the second half will be us uh, talking about the science. So blood, breath and urine tests um, as they relate to DUI cases. So as we're gonna go ahead and start with the field sobriety exercises or the roadsides, um, I want everybody to really understand and know that these are exercises, not tests. So what that means is there's physical skill and dexterity involved in these exercises. There is no pass fail. Um, they don't look at it like that and, and you don't want them to be considered that. And these are not done to prove somebody guilty beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt like at trial. These are done by the police officers on scene to establish probable cause to make an arrest. And there's a very big distinction with these two issues and especially when you folks are you know, when you're going to trial on these cases, you really need to establish that and make sure that the jury understands that the goal of these is to have a police officer decide if there's probable cause to make an arrest. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that there's enough evidence to convict somebody at trial under the guilty beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So, what are these standard field sobriety exercises? Well, they're divided attention tasks that are designed to measure somebody's, and we put it in quotes here, normal faculties. The, the thing that you really need to know and you need to be able to impress press upon, you know, whether it's a jury or you know, whatever it is as you're defending these cases, is that these are abnormal exercises that are designed or intended to measure somebody's normal faculties. And what are people's normal faculties? Well, the law actually defines them in the state of Florida for DUI, so that's fantastic. The law defines them as the ability to see, hear, walk, talk, judge distances, act in emergencies, make decisions, and drive a car, and perform the many mental and physical tasks of our daily lives. So these are, you know, these exercises don't really measure those things. Um, you know, police officers, right, are, are, they, are they abnormal or irregular? And some police officers will try to say that they're completely normal, right? And what you want to do is you really want to cross, you know, on cross-examination, you really want to cross these police officers and ask them, does a person normally walk in this heel to toe manner? Do they normally turn with a series of small steps by keeping their left foot planted on the ground? Because if you do the walk and turn correctly, when you hit that front nine, your left foot should be planted and then you will be making a series of small steps to turn around. Who does that in their normal daily life? Right? Does a person normally put one foot up six inches in the air with their arms down by their side? Okay. And and here we have, you know, what I said earlier, right? This is Florida's statute, you know, um, of the definition of normal faculties. It's not pass fail, and these must be done on a flat, well-lit surface, free and clear of debris. And that is very important, as we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But you have to scrutinize these. Do not rely on the police officer's reports, really for anything, right? But especially to say that, well, it was flat, it was well lit, and the surface was free and clear debris. Because I can tell you in over 15 years of, of practice, um, 
quite often we've seen that that is just not the case. And police officers, you know, for whatever reason, they don't do things properly. Now, these exercises, these field sobriety exercises are non-testimonial in nature. So Miranda rights do not need to be read prior to them. And there's five exercises that are generally used. It could be three, it could be five, it could be any combination. Three of these, the first three on the list, are officially recognized by NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They're the ones um, that really came up with the field sobriety exercises and did some of the, um, <clears throat> the, the studies surrounding them many years ago. You also need to know there are seated exercises. Seated exercises are available, but they're rarely ever used. And you know what? That's not my problem. That's not my client's problem. That's the police officer's problem when they choose not to use those. It's the prosecutor's problem. So what do I mean by that? Well, these seated exercises need to be used when somebody has an injury, an illness, a disability. One of those three, something going on with their legs, back, ankle, um, you know, anything that would prevent them from doing these exercises, standing, walking, balancing, and when they should be done in a seated position to make it more fair. And what we see quite often is that the police officers don't do them. Uh, when somebody says that they have an injury or, you know, a disability or something. Now, the question is, is why? Why don't they do them? Well, could be many different reasons. Um, you know, Sometimes they're just not trained. Sometimes they are, but they just choose not to do them. Maybe, you know, my hypothesis is because they're lazy, is because um, it's actually better for the, for the defendant on video because jurors can't really get their heads around these exercises like they can in understanding the walk and turn or a one leg balance at least. Um, but regardless, that's not our fault. It's not our problem. It's the prosecutor's problem. It's the police officer's problem. So when we're talking about trial, um, don't be afraid to cross them hard on this issue. You know, these are, are very important tools that we can use to our defense. Um, now, this, this, you know, this uh, picture is not the best quality. But <clears throat> the reason that I have it in my slides is this was a clip or you know, a screen a shot from one of my cases. Now, this case, if you look and see, this is from a dash cam. This is from Florida Highway Patrol. And the patrol officer and my client's uh, faces are um, blacked out or pixelated over. But what do we see in this background and the foreground? We see puddles, okay? You can't tell in this that it is raining. It's lightly raining, so it's not pouring. But what do puddles mean? Puddles mean that this area is not flat and level because water seeks its own level, right? He's standing in a puddle right now. Uh, if you look closely at the police officer's hand, it's actually at his face. And the reason it's at his face is because in this screenshot, he's wiping raindrops off of his face. So here we have it where this trooper it, um, asked our client or had our client do these field sobriety exercises while it's raining on an area that is clearly not flat and level while he's standing in a puddle. And as I said before, this happens far too often. Um, now, in this particular case, we went to trial. In this particular case, um, this was a big feature of my cross, -examine, of, uh, cross examination of this trooper. And in this particular case, the judge actually granted our judgment of acquittal motion um, after the state rested their case. So the judge completely threw this case out, dismissed this case back um, on a lack of uh, impairment issue um, because of this and combined with other you know, factors that were going on with the case. So understand, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with, you know, these type of situations, you must scrutinize this video very carefully that, that you get, and you're going to want to look for these things and exploit these, these issues in your case. Um, so let's get into the field sobriety exercises. 
The first one is called the horizontal gaze nystagmus. Now, that sounds like a fancy, uh, you know, not even legal term. That, that's a fancy medical term. Well, you know, we can we kind of call it the follow the pen exercise. In Florida, some district courts of appeals um, allow the police to talk about the medical terms and nystagmus, which is the involuntary jerking of the eye. Um, other jurisdictions don't and will just let us describe the follow the pen. And the police officers cannot even talk about um, nystagmus. All they can talk about is um, you know, a client's behavior during the exercise, meaning are they swaying? Are they moving their head instead of just moving their eyes? You know, those sort of things. Now, let's just briefly talk a little bit about what nystagmus is, just so that way you folks have a basic understanding. So long story short, um, you know, the horizontal gaze nystagmus, this is a test that really is done by ophthalmologists. There's roughly 45 different um, medical issues that can cause somebody to display signs of nystagmus, and alcohol consumption is one out of those roughly 45. Okay. What nystagmus is, is it's the involuntary jerking of the eye, and as the police officers are moving the stimulus, um, um, they're, what they're looking to see is your eye jerking like a dirty windshield wiper or a dry windshield wiper. So instead of smooth tracking, it's going to jerk, kind of like that. Um, now, when you're defending against these, you know, the police officers, there's a lot of guesswork. In order for them to do this correctly, they have to make a certain number of passes on each side. It really takes a few minutes to done right. So if you see the officers moving very quickly and doing this in 30 seconds, it's not a proper HGN. They're supposed to have their stimulus um, between 6 and 12 inches apart from your nose. Well, how do we know that this is between 6 and 12 inches and this, right? Which one's accurate, which one's not? And depending on how far away they are, also has you know an effect on 45 the 45 degree angle or prior to 45 degrees, right? So how do we really know what that is? Um, so there's great um, <clears throat> methods to cross-examine police officers on this issue if you dive deep and truly understand the HGN, if that jurisdiction that you're in allows the officers to talk about it. Um, a great resource is Duane's, D-U-A-N-E-S, which is a medical, it's not a medical journal, it's a medical um, textbook um, by this guy named Duane that is one of the foremost medical textbooks in the ophthalmology world, and that really goes deep into the HGN. Um, if your um, jurisdiction does allow police to talk about that, you know, if it's pretty easy to become more knowledgeable about these issues than the police because the police just read off of and regurgitate what they were told. They can't explain the hows and the whys, right? So when you cross-examine them, um, really hammer home that they don't understand how it truly works. They don't understand hows and whys. They just are regurgitating what they've been told by a class that they took. Maybe it was a 40-hour class. Well, you know what? That's eight hours over five days. That's nothing, okay? So that does not make them an expert. And even if the police officer is a drug recognition evaluator, um, that does not make them an expert. Um, and you can get some gold by cross-examining them. And the best way to do this is really to practice at a DMV hearing um, or if your jurisdiction allows depositions. If you can get a deposition, on the criminal case, then that's fantastic as well. And that's something that you're going to want to do. <clears throat> so the next field sobriety exercise is the walk and turn. And what they do is they put you in this instructional stance. And if you take a look uh, in this in this photograph, that's the instructional stance, which is a huge, uh, hugely difficult thing to do. It's a huge pain in the butt. Okay, you can't begin early and you can't start, quote unquote, practicing. Because if you start early, they're going to say that your mental faculty of ability to follow instructions was impaired. Because what they do, what the police do, is they're going to rapid fire questions or instructions at you. 
and you're supposed to stand there with one foot in front of the other, with your arms down by your side, listening, processing all of this information without the ability to practice or to do. And it's very crucial that you that, that you folks look at this from a common sense or a real life person's perspective of how they learn things. And that's one of the common themes that I continually use in my DUI trials when this is is at issue. Um, we don't always want to attack the field sobriety exercises, but in the in the majority of our DUI trials, we do, and that becomes a theme. And if you're if you're going to attack the field sobriety exercises, you really need to not think of it as a lawyer. You need to not think of them as the letter of the law. You need to think of them as a common person, I, aka your jury would view them. Okay, and understand the stress and anxiety and the entire situation that your client is going through, right? So there's lights going on. There's It's late at night. There's a lot of people, um, a lot of police officers. Your client may be mentally thinking about something else, such as, am I going to be a no-call, no-show tomorrow at work? Does that mean I'm going to lose my job? I'm a single parent. How is that going to affect my children? Or I've been a law-abiding citizen for 40 years in my life, and you know what? I'm terrified to be arrested, right? And I don't want that to happen. So there's a lot of things that can happen that we really need to make sure are avoided at all costs um, and things that are going on in their mind that can really affect their performance. But what you're supposed to do on the on these exercise on this particular exercise is take nine steps forward, heel touching toe. Then you're supposed to turn, and the turn is supposed to be a series of small steps. And then take nine steps back, heel touching toe, with your arms down by your side the entire time. Every little thing you do that is not 100% perfect, they're going to count against you or say that that is a deviation. And you, you know, they're not going to say that you failed, <clears throat> but they will say that, you know, um, they took that into consideration um, whether or not to, or in their determination of whether or not your normal faculties were impaired. And the more that you truly understand how these exercises are supposed to be done, the better you'll be able to attack and defend it in, the, in your client's case. Um, these should be on video, whether a dash camera or a body camera. And you're going to want to really look at and see, well, is there evidence or did the police officer write in their report about all of the fine little details? Was there a gap on any of the steps? If so, how much, right? Can we all agree there's a difference if there's a gap between heel to toe this much or this much, right? Um, did it happen on every step or just one or two? If it happened on one or two, which ones? Because there's supposed to be 18 steps. As far as the turn goes, who does it? Well, as far as anything in this, who does this normally, right? Who normally walks this way? Who normally um, walks heel to toe with their arms down by their side? So there's a lot of common sense arguments that you can make in front of a jury at a trial um, to really attack these exercises. Specifically, that um, <clears throat> specifically the walk and turn, but all of them. Um, when you, one thing that I like to do in all of these cases is I like to count up and separate each and every instruction because there's, you know, on some of these, there's between 10 and 20 separate instructions that our clients are supposed to remember and do perfectly. So again, think about these as common sense arguments. Now, this next slide is the one leg stand. Okay, this is the third of the three standardized ones. And again, when you're being rapid fire, given these instructions, you're not to begin early, you're not to practice. Um, you have to raise your legs six inches off the ground, keep your arms at your side, and count to 30 seconds 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, etc. If you put your foot down, you're supposed to put it right back up and continue counting. 
<clears throat> now, the same ways to attack the other exercises, you can attack this. This is not the way that we normally do things. So we're, the police are putting us in an abnormal situation to try and test our normal faculties. The logic is just not there. It does not make sense. Um, nobody does these things in their normal daily life. And one of the ways that you can try to even backdoor in the fact that your client maybe has never uh, been arrested for DUI before is ask the officer, you know, when you're cross-examining them and say, well, you don't, you know, isn't it true that our client's never done this before, or you don't know if our client's ever done this before, have you? So this could be very well the first time that he's ever heard these instructions. This could be the very first time in our client's life that she's ever had to do this, right? And one of the, one of the, the things that I really love on our DUI trials, when I know that the theme is going to be that we're attacking the exercises, which again, is not always the theme. Um, I love to have teachers, uh, managers, trainers, athletes, uh, coaches on my jury. And a lot of other people, uh, lawyers who lecture on this, they say they don't want those type of people because they're very judgmental. Well, I found that if we are attacking the exercises, that I like to have people who understand how others truly learn. So. For example, I was a high school basketball coach for 10 years. And I understand that, well, quite frankly, some people are smarter than others. Some people learn quicker. Um, people learn by different modalities. Most people need to try and fail and try and fail multiple times before they truly understand or get something, especially when we're talking about the pressure. Um, of being on the side of the road with an arrest hanging in the balance, right? This is not a perfect ideal condition test environment where nothing bad will happen to you or you're, where you're fully rested. There's no other environmental or mental or mo emotional factors going on like there is in real life. So when you think about this less like a lawyer and more like a, like a human being, it really helps you relate to the jury um, so much better. Now, <clears throat> the fourth exercise is the finger to nose, which is not NHTSA approved. Um, and there's, there's really two different ways to do this. And this, this picture has um, really the old way of doing it with your arms you know, by your, um, out. Um, now they, they can have people with their arms down, but you know, really it, it doesn't matter. This, I think, is one of the absolute hardest uh, exercises to do, and, and you're not even moving in this one. You know, you're not balancing, you're not uh, walking. And the reason is, is these officers can be very petty. So if you take a look at me, <clears throat> right, you're supposed to use the tip of your finger to the tip of your nose. And in most instances, when our, well, when our clients do this, they're actually 100% wrong. And quite often I've seen clients do this and the officers say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't do it correctly. And, and I've seen our clients sometimes get upset. And the reason is, is because this part of my finger is the finger pad. This is the tip of your finger. So when the officers demonstrate, they demonstrate the correct way. But look how petty this is, the difference between the tip and the pad. And so I often lecture about this and I often use the finger to nose as the example because it is such you know a petty difference between the pad and the finger and most people aren't thinking about that you know even in perfect ideal conditions so it really to me it, it does seem as though kind of like a ha gotcha moment um, that the police officers use okay now you know they're what what are they looking for well they're looking for to see uh, you know, is the tip of your finger touching the tip of your nose, not your mouth, not your bridge, not a nostril, not the pad, not the side of your finger. They're looking to see balance. They're looking to see, do you, are you able to bring your arm back down or back to the side as opposed to just leaving it there? 
Um, and do you get your right and your left correct? So there's a lot of things. They're also looking for balance and swaying issues as well. Um, again, just like all of these, I believe common sense wins, not the technical nature of the exercises. Because, you know, if the case does go to trial, you're dealing with normal people that, you know, you want to screen for common sense. Um, <clears throat> and the last field sobriety exercise is called the Romberg balance. Basically, it's stand and balance. Stand, balance, close your eyes, tilt your head back, and estimate 30 seconds. Okay. Um, what are they looking for in this? Well, they're looking to see if you have eyelid tremors. They're looking to see, did you estimate 30 seconds correctly? You know, did you estimate 15? Was it 45? Um, you know, was it two minutes? Or was it 33 seconds or, or 26 seconds, right? They're also looking to see, you know, your balance, just like all the other exercises. Um, is there a sway? You know, do you open your eyes? Do you follow instructions or not? So, you know, even though on, you know, practically, in, in practicality, the, the Romberg balance is probably the easiest and least complicated. It's It still has some complicated uh, things you have to do, um, you know, and, and things that, in my opinion, don't really demonstrate whether or not somebody is impaired by alcohol. Um, <clears throat> so some questions, right, that you folks can ask, um, you know, the police officers either during a deposition or a Bureau of Administrative Review hearing, you know, ask them how many times it took uh, for them to practice these before they could do it perfectly, right? Because they're, they're not usually gonna say, oh, somebody must do it perfectly, but in reality, that's what it is. That's what you want to establish, that it took them multiple times to practice to get better. Um, you could choose to do it, you know, as an open-ended question. You can do a hard leading question, you know, if, you're, if you really want to cross them hard. But you want to ask them about all of the correct normal actions of also that your clients completed. So if we're talking about 17 different, um, different uh, instructions and the client did 14 of them correctly, during uh, on the field sobriety exercises, well, then you want to hammer those home, right? You also want to talk about all of the normal things that your clients did during the entire DUI investigation. So if we're looking at these exercises as abnormal ways to decide somebody's normal faculties, well, let's think about this again, logically, like a normal person. Wouldn't showing, you know, let's say there's a dash cam and it shows the stop, right? If our client, we can see on video that the brake lights come on within a second or two after the police lights are activated, and our client gave the license and registration quickly, exited the car normally, walked over to the field sobriety exercise area normally, didn't have a sway or balance issues. Isn't that, you know, if you have those facts, isn't that a better indicator of somebody's normal faculties than these abnormal exercises? And if you don't have that on video, well, you can get a good idea of whether it happened or not from the reports. So what do we mean by that? Well, the officers are trained to write everything that your client did incorrectly or poorly in their police reports. So if there's nothing in the report saying that your client had problems or a delay pulling over, well, then you can assume, you should assume that your client did break quickly, did pull over in a quick, normal, and safe manner, right? And if the officer upon questioning says that your client didn't, well, then that's further uh, ammunition in cross-examination to talk about how the officer, why didn't the officer write that in their report? And how do they remember that months later? And talking about the fact and their training that they are supposed to write everything in the report. Because if they're, you know, if the officer is trying to be cute and say, well, I don't know if it did or not, well, then, you know, you can go really hard in, into that level of cross examination about writing a poor report because that report is supposed to refresh the recollection months later in a trial. Or, if the officer's honest and straight up and says, hey, look, you know what? 
client must have done it correctly because I didn't mark it down. Well, then even, you know, then that's fine too, right? And that's obviously going to be good for you. So <clears throat> you're going to get some really good, um, you know, cross-examination, um, uh, you know, data or information to, to use on cross from these things. When, when you think about it from just a practical human being standpoint, not even a lawyer standpoint, you know, right? What's a better indicator of, of people's normal faculties? The way that they're supposed to drive and the way they're supposed to react to being pulled over or these, you know, cockamamie exercises that, that NHTSA just made up, right? So, so that's, uh, that's very powerful in these cases. Um, <clears throat> now, this is huge. And this is quite often a very big theme of my cases. Not always, but obviously it's got to have the right context. But when we're attacking the field sobriety exercises, officers often confuse average with normal. Actually, not often. They always do. So the measurement standards are not one size fits all. And, you know, the difference between average or normal is this. Well, everybody who's on this webinar, you know, you take, I don't know, you, let's just say you take 100 or 20 of your closest friends and family, right? You take, you know, you could even say everybody who's in the courtroom at that time. And if you took them all together and kind of mixed them up, and sliced them in the middle, well, what would you get, right? That's the definition of average. You would get an average. Not one single person, whether it's a cohort of 20, 100, or whoever is in your courtroom, would be that average person. That would not be anybody, right? <clears throat> so what they're doing is they're confusing the words average with normal. Okay, we are all our own version of normal. Um, what does that mean, right? Well, <clears throat> our speech. We don't all talk the same way. Some of us are from foreign countries. Right? We talk differently. Some people are mumblers. You know, right now I have a bit of a cold, so my voice today is not the way that it normally is every day. People act differently under stress. Um, you know, there's many environmental factors to this. People in, you know, Florida don't talk the way people from Chicago talk, right? Same thing about the way that we walk in balance. Uh, same things with our mental faculties, right? We don't learn the same way. Okay. Um, you know, think about yourself. Are you the type of person that's cool and calm under pressure? Or are you a nervous Nelly? And either one's okay. It's just a matter of how do you do things, right? Some people, um, whether they're cool or calm or nervous is situational. But just because somebody's cool and calm and somebody is a nervous Nelly does not mean that that's not the way they are, they normally are. And think about it like this. I've been on this webinar, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Are you folks in a position to judge my normal faculties? Absolutely not. So how long are the police or do the police have to judge your client's normal faculties? 10, 15, 30 minutes. Um, <clears throat> what I often will, will say, you know, to the extent that a, a judge will let me in, in voir dire, um, but especially in, in closing argument, is have you ever met somebody who at first you thought that person was amazing and then you realize that person's just not who you thought they were, right? And I, I said that once at a, at a different lecture and a lady in the front row started laughing and she said, yeah, I married the bleep, right? And the bleep was, was not a, an endearing term. Um, because, and everybody laughed because we realized that first impressions are often wrong. And when you break this down into just psychological human elements and understanding, the jury really can understand. Um, you know, the prosecutors and police, they're going to be robots. They're going to think and act like lawyers. 
And your job as the DUI defense practitioner is to not think like a lawyer, is to think like a common sense human being the way that your jury thinks and be able to attack these exercises from a common sense, normal person's thought perspective um, because then they will truly understand and get the issues. Now, I'm going to go back a slide because when we're, again, um, another way to attack these is when we talk about, you know, prevention versus effect, affected performance. So um, the officers, a lot of times what they're going to say to a client is, well, is there anything that would prevent you from doing these exercises? Well, yeah, sure. If you had a foot amputated, you couldn't do some of these exercises, right? But if you had a bad ankle, it would affect it. A torn ACL, a bad back, shin splints, right? And most of these officers, they're not asking if, you know, you, they don't go the full the full way. They don't say, do you have any knee, back, ankle injuries, anything that would affect your performance, you know, negatively affect it, right? They're, a lot of them are just trained in, hey, do you have any injury, do you have any disabilities that would prevent you from doing this? Well, there's a huge difference between disabilities and injuries, right? And there's a huge difference between prevention and effect and being effective. So you have to um, really understand and be able to critically attack these because you you need again, you know, normal people are going to be making these determinations, right? And the further of a wedge that you can drive between um, the prosecutors and the police is not being normal people or not giving your client a fair shake, um, the better it's going to be. And these are great points for cross-examination. And again, the, these seated exercises. Um, <clears throat> all right, so in the context, um, this is one of my cases that we had. And um, this was the walk and turn exercise. And what I did in, in this particular case was I counted out, and I talked a little bit about this a few slides ago, but what I did was I counted out each and every instruction on the walk and turn. And I separated each and everything, you know, super granularly, right? To the point where I determined there was 17 separate instructions on this. Um, and if you see, I, I wrote them all out here. <clears throat> and what I did in trial was I broke each and every one of these down separately. It was a bit monotonous. It did not have, you know, the big Perry Mason moment at the end. But what I did was I went through each and every one of these hyper detailed. And I had the, uh, in this particular instance, it was a community service aide who had um, my client do these exercises uh, back at the station, um, not on the roadside. And she admitted that my client did 14 out of these 17 correct. Now, doesn't that sound better, significantly better than just focusing on three things that, that the client did wrong and saying that they were looking for you know, a certain number of, of cues or that they found that there were three cues that, you know, that, that my client failed or you know, did not do uh, to standard, right? Because they won't say failed. But he did 14 correctly, right? And when you really put it in those terms, it's a lot more persuasive. Um, and here's what I talked about earlier. You know, if, right, for some DUI cases, the clients do pretty well and they don't look like they're, you know, hammered, right, or wasted maybe, you know, the theme is that they were slightly or moderately impaired. You know, maybe there's a there's a breath case as well on this. Um, you know, that's that's you know over the limit, but not too high, right? Um, we want teachers, coaches, managers who understand how people learn and understand that people learn by failing, learn by doing things incorrectly. You know, using that common sense. Um, it's to, for, you know, when this has been the theme, it's a very powerful theme of, of the case. Um, so uh, that's really it for the beginning portion or, or for the, the, the first half as we're discussing the, uh, the field sobriety exercises. What I want to do now is transition into the breathalyzer 
and then we'll talk a little bit about urine and we'll talk a little bit about blood. And understand everything that we're talking about here today, these are basic, you know, introductory level discussions. Um, if we were to go to more of a, an advanced level, that would be the topic for its own seminar, which, you know, we have no problem, um, you know, maybe we can even do it at a, at a later date. Um, but really, this is just to give a really good overview. So that way, the the new DUI practitioner can understand that, hey, these breathalyzers are not these big mythical things that cannot be beaten. Um, quite often, they can, and they are beaten uh, when you know what you're doing. <clears throat> so let's talk and let's learn what is the intoxilizer 8000, right? The breathalyzer. Well, first of all, don't be afraid of a high breath test. Um, you know, it's, it's, once you know what it is, it, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so let's talk about it, right? So this was first manufactured in 2001. So over 20 years ago, it was, it's been used in Florida since 2006. That's when we had the Motorola Razor, the Nokia um, flip phones. We had the Nextel uh, walkie talkie, you know, the Sprint Nextel walkie talkies, if you remember that. Um, the Windows operating system was Windows Vista. And the technology that it uses is infrared, in, infrared microwave radiation technology from the 1920s. So it's over 100 years old, this technology. So when you can, again, break this down in common sense terms, it resonates with the jury. The, the first iPhone came out in 2007. The first iPhone didn't even have copy and paste functionality, and there was no app store on the first iPhone. That came out in 2008 with the um, with the second iPhone, the, the 3G. So, you know, if, if anybody of you in here are old enough to remember those things, technology moves at a lightning fast pace. Um, but yet, the technology involved in, in these machines uh, does not. So the picture on the right, um, the two pictures on the right, okay, are important. The top picture shows one of the very first breathalyzer contraptions with a balloon and these tubes and, you know, and all these kind of crazy things. And the the picture on the, on the bottom right of the Intoxilizer 8000 pretty much has the same kind of things inside, just it's hidden inside this box. Now, one thing to note is the Intoxilizer 8000 is portable. It has a handle on it. You can see the handle in this picture, um, which I'll get to later as we, you know, as we talk about, um, you know, the the time of driving argument that we're going to have. Um, there's a keyboard. It's for all intents and purposes, it's a computer. It's a computer that's 20 years old. That's running on, you know, 20 year old uh, operating software. Um, they don't like to call it a computer. They call it an instrument. I still don't know what that means. I still don't know why they call it that. My assumption is they think it sounds fancier or it actually gives it more credibility. I don't know. Um, but if you ask them, they'll they'll say instrument. And I don't. Most of the people that we've cross-examined can't even tell you why. Can't even tell you why they call it an instrument. So, you know, <clears throat> to me, it's a computer. And if you've ever heard one. Uh, operate, it sounds like a pre um, or, you know, a mid 1990s AOL dial up. So a pre Ethernet uh, computer or modem, which again, for jurors, you know, common sense, they're hearing it go, er, 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 right? Like that old school, you know, like you're logging into AOL in 1997 here. And when you're able to relate that back to something like logging into AOL in 1997, it really resonates with common people, common sense, normal people, how old and ancient and unreliable this technology is. So what we're going to talk about today with the breathalyzer is just a few different issues and common areas of unreliability. We're going to talk about breath temperature. We're going to talk about partition ratio, uh, margin of error, time of driving, the 0 0.020 agreement, and source code. So let's go into breath temperature. 
Um, just like in the field sobriety exercises, how we talked um, that they confuse average with normal. Well, guess what? They do the exact same on this with the breath temperature. So the machine does not have a separate breath temperature sensor. And what it does, it estimates the breath temperature at 34 degrees centigrade, which is 93.3, I'm sorry, 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Studies have shown <clears throat> that higher breath temperatures will increase the breath alcohol level and lower temperatures will decrease it. And a study in 1995 uh, that you know, was a scientifically valid study of 700 subjects found that most people, or actually all, everybody in the study, the temperature range, the breath temperature range was between 33 and 36.7 degrees Celsius. And the study recommended if they had to use an average, that the average should be 35 degrees instead of 34. And if that's true, which the study shows that it is, then the Intoxilizer 8000 is overestimating or creating a false positive on every single breath test, okay? Um, and that, when you can break that down in, in layman's terms, that's huge. And, you know, again, you, you know, when you can cross-examine um, on all of these issues, not just the breath temperature, but these breath techs and these supposed, you know, experts that they bring in. <clears throat> now, first of all, you want to know what they're going to testify to. So that's why you should subpoena them for the, you know, subpoena them for the, um, the DMV hearing. And if you can get a deposition or two, you know, whether it's this case or a previous case, you know, that's fantastic because you, you want to know what they're going to testify to. Um, but if they're not able to really explain the inner workings, which most of them aren't, they're going to look terrible. They're going to look like they're just police officers that are coming to regurgitate facts. Um, and it's something that a jury can't see, hear, feel, or touch. And so what I've found is most of the time when people can't really wrap their heads around something, when it's more amorphous, um, they just will not put any weight into it. If they can't understand it, it's gone. Right? If they can't really feel as though they know how it's working, they're just going to say no, no thank you, and get rid of the whole thing, or you know, not count it at all. Um, the second thing is partition ratio. So this is a ratio to convert breath to blood levels. Okay? It's, it's based on Henry's Law. You don't really need to know much about Henry's Law, but what it does is it assumes a closed system, um, and partition ratios... Again, scientifically valid studies have shown that the partition ratios vary between 900 to 1 and 3,400 to 1. And according to a study in 1983, they said that the correct partition ratio is 1,756 to 1. And same thing, when they are overestimating the partition ratio, well, then it's overestimating breath tests. So people that have lower partition ratios, right, actually are having a false positive on the breath test, okay? So that's two, just two easy ways right there um, to, you know, understand that these things are creating false positives. And remember, it's not your job to prove what your client's partition ratio is, right? It's the prosecutor and the police officer's job to convince a jury beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt that your client was driving, or at the time of your client's driving, their breath alcohol level was over a 0.08. So all you have to do is grill them on these things. Even if you're getting, I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't know, I don't know, as long as you can explain that to the jury, as long as you can seem more knowledgeable than the police officer or the breath techs. And the jury's going to, you know, they're, they're not going to, to count or put a lot of stock in what the officer's saying about these things. Um, so that, that's very important. Now, <clears throat> there's a margin of error on these, on, on these uh, tests. So what happens is every month there's a monthly inspection and then there's an annual inspection. And what happens at these inspections, uh, CMI Corporation uh, out of Tennessee, which is the manufacturer of the Intoxilizer series, 
and the 8,000, um, <clears> they send these dry gas canisters to the different departments during their inspection, right? And these dry gas canisters are closed simulators, okay? Um, these are closed simulator solutions that are supposed to be perfect, okay? Um, all, all of the solutions that they give. And what happens is in perfect circumstances, which is what happens when CMI mixes up these, these canisters and, and solutions to hook up to the intoxilizer to test them, right? Closed system, sterile environment. Um, and what I mean by that is contrast that to when a human being gives a breath test, um, <clears throat> right? We all learned through COVID that how quickly air particles move, right? How quickly people can be sick from other people. Well, imagine if you're the 10th or even fourth person that night in that room giving a breath test. Sure, they change out the mouthpieces and so on and so forth, but there's alcohol in the air, okay? Um, you're breathing in what other people are breathing. Your body just as a human being is not a closed system because things are coming in and out of your body, contaminants, pollutants, right? But yet these, these canisters, the, the solutions are perfectly mixed. And when they're perfectly mixed and tested in a perfectly controlled environment, there's still a margin of error. And the acceptable range for the 0.05 test, it's a plus or minus 0.05. So that means these machines will pass the test anywhere from a 45 to a 55 on the, the 050 test. And on the 080 test, it's the same plus or minus 0 0.005, you know, five points. So a 75 to an 85, anywhere in that range counts. And in the 0 0.20 test, it's a plus or minus of 10. So up to a 20 point swing, meaning a 190 counts as passing and a 210 counts as passing. So when you look at these numbers that I have on the left, right, 0.204. Well, that passes. An 049 passes, right? 079. None of these are the same every single time, and this counts as a passing. So if the test has a wide margin of error with a closed system in ideal situations, why won't the police give a margin of error during the real thing, right? And the, you know, the common theme that I have, and especially through this lecture, is the more that you can break this down to people as a common sense argument, the more they're going to understand and go, wait, 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 wait a minute, right? You know, the lawyer, the defense lawyer doesn't have to prove to me that there was what the margin of error is or how it is it worse, is it more or less for a human being in this situation? They just have to tell me, geez, wait a minute. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Perfect conditions. And there's these huge margins of error. Huh, right? You know, you want people to be skeptical of, of the breathalyzer, the, the intoxilizer. Now, <clears throat> the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is different than the point, um, than, the, than the margin of error, is what we call a 0 0.020 agreement. So it's a 20-point agreement. And what that means is when your client is giving the breath test, they have to give two valid samples. And what you'll see is most of the time, the two samples are not the same. Now, this argument doesn't work in every case because if you have a client who blows a 151 and then four minutes later, another 151, well, then, you know, you're really not going to want to use this argument. But even if they don't, you know, even if it's a, a 151 and then the second one's a 144, let's say, right? Or the first test is an 096 and the, seven, the second test is a point you know, 101, right? Um, they're not the same. And what the, um, you know, what the breath text will say is that they have to be within 20 points of one another. So what you can get them to admit is that an 079 and an 098 would both be considered valid samples under their rules. So the very common way to do this, right, common sense, so that way your jurors can wrap their heads around it, are using a scale. If you got on the scale 
and it said you weighed 79 pounds. You got off. You went back, you know, it zeroed out. And then three minutes later, you go back on that scale and it says you weigh 98 pounds. You would say the scale is broken. Easy. I mean, easy. No debate, no nothing, right? But what the police would do is they will tell you that that scale was working correctly, right? So that's another thing that, that you can attack. And, you know, doesn't matter why that's the agreement or why that's allowed or not. That's just what, you know, use their own rules against them. That's their rule. So if it's applicable in your case, you know, use it um, because it, it, it does work. Another one of the things that we attack is time of driving. So as I showed you on that, on that uh, slide earlier, the Intoxilizer 8000 is portable. It does have a handle. And <clears throat> when we're talking about the time of driving argument, for DUI checkpoints and saturation patrols, they will quite often bring the Intoxilizer 8000 to the scene, to the roadway. So if they're going to bring it sometimes, why not bring it all the time, right? And what that goes into is, well, the prosecutors and the police have to prove that your client's breath alcohol level was over 0.08 at the time that they were driving, not at any point, not an hour or two hours later, but at the time that they were driving. That's what the law says, right? Not our problem, it's their problem. So you have to hold them accountable and you have to, you know, make the jury understand that they could and should have had that breathalyzer on scene, but they chose not to. Now, these days, more and more jurisdictions are having the breathalyzers on scene, whether it's, um, you know, they're in, whether it's like a Suburban or a Tahoe or an Explorer and, and, and they're going to have them there. Uh, but if they don't and your breath test is an hour to two hours after, well, that's fantastic because, you know, we don't know if you're if the client was absorbing or eliminating alcohol. You know, generally it absorbs and eliminates on a bell curve, but it's not our job to prove that. We have no idea, and they're not going to bring in an expert on a misdemeanor DUI case to try to do wid marks or a retrograde extrapolation. They're just not. And you know, you can you can look. You know, for this level, it's not, you know, we really don't need to go into wind marks or retrograde extrapolation, but basically it's about trying to relate back um, to see what the breath alcohol level was over time. And that's exactly why in, in DUI manslaughter cases, when they do blood draws, they'll usually do two blood draws an hour apart to really, you know, get a much better um, idea of what's going on with your body. Um, and they'll, of course, they'll have medical experts to try and testify to those things. But on these, they're just going to have two breath tests, you know, three three to four minutes apart, roughly an hour or two after you were driving when you were back at the station. Okay, uh, so really hammer that home, um, you know. And and again, you as the the defense attorney don't have to prove any of these things, right? It's their job to prove it, um, and they'll never be able to answer the why. And if you leave the jury wanting to know why they didn't do this, that that helps a lot um, because they're never going to get that answer from the prosecutors or from the police. And another um, good argument is <clears throat> you know, CMI, the corporation that manufactures these, they've never disclosed the source code and they, um, you know, they cite trade secrets and um, they've won this battle in court over and over again. So let's use it against them. They're part of their, uh, their agreement, their contract with Florida Department of Law Enforcement says that no police officer in the state of Florida is ever allowed to open up the intox slides. So ask these officers, hey, you've never actually opened this machine, right? You've never, quote unquote, gone under the hood, have you? Right? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when that becomes an issue, I love to have computer people or mechanics on my jury, people who are used to going under the hood to see how things work, to fix things. Even mechanics, you know, nowadays they, you know, they have the, the, the computer modules that just, you know, pop in right under the dash, um, under the steering wheel. But a lot of times those control modules are wrong or all they'll do is give a surface level diagnosis. And if you ask any experienced, um, you know, car mechanic, they're going to tell you they're, they don't care what that computer says. 
There is no substitute for them going under the hood and them seeing that for themselves, based on their training and experience, what's wrong, and them using you know that instead of what a, a computer says. If you ask computer people, get them, and, and the, the, again, this could be a theme in voir dire, this could be something in closing, but um, <clears throat> you know, computer people understand garbage in equals garbage out. They understand that you know the math is only as good as the equation or the algorithm. Right? They understand that you know if you're talking about Windows Vista, it was a horrible, um, you know, software. You know, Windows XP, Windows 2000. You know, all of these ancient techno technologies, um, and they understand that technology moves so fast. For so, they're going to think you're going to want them to think critically and say, well, wait a minute, these police officers have came in and, and explained to me that this mysterious thing is infallible. Yet they have never gone under the hood themselves? Again, why? And they'll never give you that answer, right? Um, so that's what you want from people. And so, you know, again, don't be afraid to have that mechanic or that computer or tech person um, on your jury. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here we go again. You know, just um, if you... Uh, if you want, and what you should do is you should be familiar with this link to go, in, especially you know if you practice in Florida, to go through the FDLE's um, you know alcohol testing program, and you can see all of the inspection data for that specific intoxilizer. You can also see the subject test data for your client and everybody who gave a breath test that night or that year or that month. From that same intoxilizer. So you really, you know, there, there's a lot more that we can go into the record um, aspect of it that's a little bit beyond the scope of today because I just wanted to give you guys some really good quick hitters to, uh, you know, to really attack this. But go in and, and spend, you know, you got to go deep, you know, spend, spend some real time looking at this um, on FDLE's website, right, or the department's website to really understand these, these records. And um, here's a quote from a, from a judge. So anytime we can use a judge's quote is is fantastic, right? So um, this was a case in Orange County in Orlando from you know a little you know a decade ago. The Intoxilizer 8000 is a magic black box assisting the prosecution in convicting citizens of DUI. The defendant is required to blow into the box. The defense has shown significant and continued anomalies in the operation of the Intoxilizer 8000's operation. The prosecution argues most of the tests do not show anomalies. In fact, a high percentage of the tests may show no anomalous operation. That the Intoxilizer 8000 mostly works, which is what the prosecutors are saying, is an insufficient response when a citizen's liberty is at risk. Now, I wish all judges thought this way, um, you know, and obviously all juries, but that's pretty powerful when, when you hear that in case law. Uh, from you know from a case uh, by a judge, right? That's very very strong. And before we jump to the urine, there was a fantastic article that came out in the New York Times a few years ago that you that everybody on here should Google and just get familiar with. And it talks about breathalyzers in a few different states, Florida being one of them. Um, and it just talks about all of the problems. Um, and you know. That's just good to read and to to know and to understand, you know, and, and get some background from that article because that expose was was fantastic. Um, you now, you know, how's that that how's that practically going to help you? Well, you know, you certainly can't cite to that article in a motion to suppress or at a trial, but you know, even reading that will help your you know help you come up with more ideas and and understand and feel confident that that's all that this intoxilizer is. It's just some magic black box that we don't even really know how it works. And if we don't know how it works and the cops don't know how it works, how can we expect a jury to really trust this, right? And, and that's the bottom line. So now we're going to talk a little bit about urine and blood samples. Um, urine is very important. Urine DUIs, when you know what you're doing, especially when we're talking about, <clears throat> you know, obviously alcohol, but, but also drugs, um, urine DUIs can be beat, you know, very easily if you know what you're doing. So urine is nothing more than a waste byproduct of what was once in your blood. And the key word was once, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, think about this like a Ziploc bag inside your body. 
meditate. Yes, it is physically present in your body. It's there. But this is not influencing behavior, current behavior at all. Um, because it is already the byproduct that is waiting to be eliminated through your urine, through, you know, when you go to the bathroom. So this will tell you what at some moment in time was in your system, but you can't use this or the prosecutors and, and experts can't use urine to say whether or not you were impaired. Um, it's extremely unreliable. It's very difficult to extrapolate back to time of driving and any expert witness um, that has any level of credibility will say that. If you're, if in your jurisdiction, the state's expert witnesses are saying that they can do this uh, with urine, um, it is just simply not true. And there are a plethora of, of witness, of experts out there that will easily contradict this. Anybody who has any um, scientific level of credibility will be able to destroy them. Um, you know, if, if you get that witness to, to, if you know, if you have your own expert witness, but what you really should do is take a deposition, get, you know, court leave of court to take a deposition of these medical, you know, so-and-so experts. Um, if they're, if it's, if this is a urine DUI um, down in South Florida, um, in Fort Lauderdale, the chief toxicologist for the Broward uh, County medical examiner's office He's a state witness, but yet he testifies as if he's a defense witness and says over and over and over again, he cannot and will not ethically um, try to extrapolate anything back or give any comment um, about whether or not the drugs were therapeutic or whether they were, you know, um, intoxicated or whether, you know, whether, whether they caused impairment. He cannot and will not ethically. Um, so when you have, you know, the state's own prosecution uh, working against them or own experts working against them, it's pretty good for your case. Um, <clears throat> and, and here's what I, you know, what I was saying before. Um, it doesn't say when you had the consumed the drugs or the substance. It doesn't say how much. And it doesn't say how you used it. <clears throat> so what I mean is, <clears throat> was it snorted? Was it? injected was it smoked all of those things right <clears throat> can change the way that prescription medication and illegal substances are you know um, affect your body okay and again the big thing is that they cannot give an opinion on whether or not they were therapeutic or impairing and understand one of the big differences between um you know prescription you know drug duis whether it's you know, especially for prescription medication, is there's no legal limit for drugs in a DUI case, um, even for illegal drugs, right? There's no marijuana legal limit in the state of Florida. Now, I understand the state of Washington has one, and I believe Colorado has it where it's now recreationally legal. Um, but in the state of Florida, we don't. And how do we know what level for your client? not for the average nor normal average or normal person quote unquote normal person but how do we know what level of alprazolam which is Xanax or what level of um, you know oxycodone which is Percocet is therapeutic versus impairing right how can the prosecutors prove it they cannot just as simple now look if your client's stumbling all over vomits all over themselves and you know looks extremely impaired then the prosecutors might win on an impairment theory but they're not going to win on you know on a on a urine you know on a scientific theory okay and as i said before depositions of toxicologists are an absolute must so let's talk a little bit and give a you know a brief overview about blood samples so you're only going to see these blood samples um, under the following circumstances. Really, DUI with, you know, DUI manslaughter or vehicular homicide, DUI with serious bodily injury, or if a breath test is impossible or impractical. Um, that's really it. <clears throat> so let's go over some of these. Um, let's first start with if a breath test is impossible or impractical. So Usually it's going to be a car crash. Maybe your client, you know, usually your client will be at the hospital and they're going to ask your client. Um, in that situation, they can ask your client to consent. Okay. Your client can still say no. Okay. Your, your client can still refuse that. 
They cannot forcibly take blood in that circumstance, but at least they can ask if they believe it's impossible or impractical. Now in a DUI manslaughter or a vehicular homicide where there's still you know, um, issues with alcohol or chemical or controlled substances or serious bodily injury, well then they can ask and they can also in the state of Florida get a warrant, okay? Um, and the warrant takes a little bit of time, but it's, it, you know, nowadays um, they can get electronic warrants. There's always a judge on duty at all at all times. So they're they're pretty good about, about getting those. And really those will be the, you know, the, the different types of situations. Um, blood cases can be beaten, okay? And <clears throat> a lot of times prosecutors aren't really equipped to defend against our allegations of, you know, fourth, uh, Fourth Amendment violations with uh, these blood draws. So you really need to go, you know, much deeper than we're going to talk about today. Um, but you want to get an advanced level understanding about how uh, blood DUIs work and how to beat them. <coughs> now, um, <clears throat> let's talk about medical records, investigative subpoenas for blood. So. Well, before actually I do that, let, let me kind of break this down. There, there's two types of blood cases, um, you know, DUI blood cases. There's legal blood and medical blood. So medical um, medical blood is blood that's taken by you know a hospital or you know a medical provider for the purposes of medical diagnosis and treatment. So it would be, let's say you're at a hospital and the hospital wants to give you you know, Percocet for pain. Well, they can't give you Percocet if it's going to have a synergistic effect with alcohol or with some other drugs. So they're going to need to run a toxicology, you know, screen to know, hey, should we give this person Tylenol or should we give this person morphine or Percocet, right? Um, because what they certainly don't want to do is uh, kill you because of the synergistic effects of what's in your system and what they give you, because then that would be medical malpractice and obviously you would die and you know your family would sue the hospital and, and they wouldn't do that. So due to their medical oath, their medical treatment for that purposes, a lot of times they're gonna take blood draw. Um, that is what we call medical blood. Legal blood is blood taken, it could be taken still by a medical professional at the request of law enforcement or investigative and criminal prosecution purposes, meaning if they get a warrant, that's legal blood. If they ask a client and the client consents, that's legal blood. So um, <clears throat> understand the difference between the two. Now, when we're talking about medical records, investigative subpoenas, we're talking about medical blood, okay? So um, when the state attorney or the, um, or even the, uh, the police officer through you know their investigative subpoena powers, uh, when they're trying to get your HIPAA protected records, the law basically says that we have to do a balancing act between your client's HIPAA protected rights and medical records versus the state's interest in prosecuting a, a potential criminal case. So what the state must do is they must serve the client or the attorney with a notice of intent to serve a subpoena ducis tecum. And that basically says, hey, we're putting you on notice that we're going to, you know, get these medical records and we're going to put, we're going to send a subpoena ducis tecum to the hospital or the ambulance or whoever um, to get your client's HIPAA protected medical records. You have 10 days to object. Always, always, always object. Absolutely. And in the state of Florida, the judge must set what's called a hunter hearing. It's from a case called, you know, they'd be hunter. Um, long story short, you're probably going to lose the hunter hearing. As long as the prosecutors can prove a nexus between, you know, um, the reason that they're seeking this and the criminal case, and that it's part of an ongoing investigation, uh, they're going to win according to the law. But we make them do their work. We don't play the result; we play the process. The process is: is good things happen when you make prosecutors work hard for it. So, what do we mean? Object, object, object. I've had cases where we've objected in writing, usually over email, um, and, you know, or we can file a, a written objection, you know, with, uh, with the clerk. We've done it both ways. Um, and 
the prosecutors just never set it for a hunter hearing. It's not my job. It's not your job to set it for a hunter hearing. It's their job, right? Let them do it. And if they don't, you know, you be quiet and you don't say a word. Okay. And we've had cases that we've won in large part because the prosecutors were overwhelmed and forgot. And then we're ready for trial or a motion. And you know what? They're scrambling. They don't have their ducks in a row. And before you know it, they're coming begging to us to, you know, to negotiate um, a reduced charge with their tail between the legs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, we've talked about the nexus, um, you know, force them to do it. Now, let's say you go forward with this hearing. I can tell you there's been about five times in my career where I've won Hunter here. So it's still worth it even on the merits. Okay, It's unlikely, but you know what? There's a 5% chance to win. It's worth it. It's worth it, right? And even when we lose the Hunter Hing, what we ask is we ask that the judge get the records in camera. And then the judge goes through the records and then decides what is disclosable and what is not. For example, if your client has an STD or you know HIV or some other type of medical issue, that's not relevant in any way whatsoever to their prosecution. And the prosecutor should not have uh, access to your client's HIPAA-protected medical records. So what we do in our case is we say, Judge, fine, if you're going to grant this, I understand. However, we want the records to go directly to you, Your Honor. We want you to review it and then decide what is disclosable. And if you have good judges, they'll do that. And what happens is judges are human beings. And we've had cases where that's happened. And you know what? The judge never followed up to make sure, make sure they get it, right? Maybe that it was sent out, the subpoena was sent, and who knows, the hospital didn't comply. Okay, fantastic. Judge certainly wasn't following up the way a prosecutor would. Or the judge gets it and it's sitting on the judge's desk under a pile of paperwork because it's not a priority for the judge. Fantastic right? And the prosecutor forgets, the judge forgets, and again, doesn't matter, okay? Not our job. So we always want people to make people do the work, go the extra mile. And, you know, again, for this, we're doing a very broad-based overview of, of breath, urine, and blood tests. Um, but these are some really good tactics that will make a huge difference where you don't need to be truly at that advanced level. Um, I want every DUI practitioner that's listening to this to, to get to an advanced level. You should, but when we're talking about beginner stuff, um, you know, these tips and tricks should help you and get you a fantastic kickstart into, you know, into your practice as a DUI defense attorney. Um, hope you enjoyed my, my part. Hope you enjoyed this entire CLE presentation. Um, <clears throat> remember, I'm Adam Rossin, the founder and CEO of the Rossin Law Firm. We help good people when bad things happen so they can achieve their best future. And we'd love to keep in touch. Hi there, my name's attorney Scott Simmons with the Rawson Law Firm, and I'm here to talk to you about the DUI trial experience. So the topics we're gonna to be discussing today are the theme of your trial, what is and how to properly use motions in limine, jury selection or voir dire, cross-examination or the state's case in chief, judgments of acquittal, the defense's case in chief, and more importantly, your client testifying, and lastly, everyone's favorite, closing arguments. Let's get started with theme. So what is a theme? When you're thinking about what your theme is for a trial, it is the message you want to relay to a jury. So your theme is how you're gonna get to not guilty. It allows the jury to easily understand what you're saying. You're saying your client is not guilty. So the most important thing to discuss when coming up with your theme is jury instruction 3.7, which is reasonable doubt. That's how we get to not guilty is by arguing that there's reasonable doubt in the case. There's lots of different tricks for themes. So there's the rule of threes that you do three different words. There's alliteration where each word starts with the same thing, or there's one that rhymes. Um, my favorite DUI theme that I had was no drive, no DUI. Um, I was fighting the first element of DUI, actual physical control, and the car was immovable. So the theme was no drive, no DUI. Again, something very simple, only a few words, that resonates with the jury and that when they go back into that jury deliberation room, they're able to think to themselves, he said no drive, no DUI, that's the first element, that, that means not guilty, we have to check not guilty. That's the whole purpose of a theme. Some things you wanna avoid when doing a theme are big complicated words that you can't say or that the jury won't be able to say, long sentences, 
Um, you want to keep them short and to the point. If you, not every case is going to have the perfect theme. It's okay to just get up there and have your theme be, my client is not guilty of driving under the influence. My client is not guilty. It doesn't always, not every fact pattern is going to fit a perfect theme like no drive, no DUI. But if you can find one, you want to use it. And the most important thing about a theme is using it. So you want to use it repeatedly throughout trial. You want to say it multiple times in your opening. You want to bring it up in cross-examination. If you are putting on evidence, you want it to be part of your evidence, and you want to hammer it home in closing. So the next thing about themes is not only are you going to have a theme, but most likely the state is also going to have a theme, and you have a decision to make. Do you want to try to flip the state's theme? And this is where I have to recommend that you don't do something you're not comfortable with. So if it's not you, it's not going to come off well. Um, but the thing you should know is that most misdemeanor DUIs are going to be handled by state attorneys who are using boilerplate themes, meaning that they're themes that you're going to hear again and again. The two easiest ones in every misdemeanor trial is that this is a simple case or that this is a case about choices. These are themes that you can easily flip by saying that this case is anything but simple. Let's look at all the exercises my client had to do before being placed under arrest. Or if we're going to talk about choices, let's talk about the wrong choices the officer made. Those are easy ways in which you can flip the state's theme. You don't have to flip them. Do it if you're comfortable with it. But again, it's a way for the jury to resonate with your argument. Let's talk about motions in limine. Um, the quote here is, the best defense is a good offense, and that's what motions in limine are. So a motion in limine stands for a motion at the start. What you're doing in a motion in limine is you're asking for an evidentiary ruling on a certain issue before the trial starts. It's important to know what it is not though. It's not a motion to suppress. You need to make sure that these are filed separately and before trial. Um, additionally, you don't wanna have too much complicated things in your motion to eliminate that should have been in a motion to suppress because a judge most likely won't even hear it or will delay the trial and have it set for just that motion to suppress and move it on. Um, so you need to be very specific in your motions to eliminate that it's not really a motion to suppress, but just an, a simple evidentiary ruling. And the purpose of it is for a few things. The main purpose is to allow for a smoother trial. But what you should be using it for is to keep all the bad stuff out and to get all the good stuff in. And most people are used to keeping the bad stuff out, but they don't really understand what keeping the good stuff in means. So you can ask for motions in limine that rule in your favor to allow you to talk about things or allow the state not to talk about things that is going to benefit your case. So let's talk about the do's when you're writing motions in limine. You want to be as specific as possible about what you want to keep out. If you write a boilerplate motion in limine, judges are going to say, well, this is just the law. I don't need to tell them to follow the law. And they're not going to give you a clear ruling. You don't want that. The whole point is you want to get a pre-trial ruling. The only way you're going to force a judge to do that is if you give them these specifics. So how do we do that? If you took a deposition and you know what you want to want to keep out, quote it in the deposition. Let the judge know, I'm expecting this testimony to come out that came out in, in deposition, and I want a pre-trial ruling that they are not allowed to say this, and I want the state to instruct their witness as so. And you want to use the case law and the rules of evidence. You have to back up your argument with case law and the rules of evidence, or you're not going to get the rulings that you want. Let's talk about the don'ts. So as I said, don't file a boilerplate motion in limine. Um, especially for DUIs, there's a, there are a few standard rules that everyone has which it's okay to have the standard rules, but add to them. Don't just have the generic rule of law, apply facts of your case to it. And don't just state a rule of evidence. Don't just say, I don't wanna allow in any hearsay, because if you say that, the judge isn't gonna rule on it. I don't wanna allow in this specific hearsay that I believe this officer is going to try to allude to, and then state what it is. That will get you the ruling you want. And the other thing is try not to file them at 2 a.m. the night before, um, it's difficult for some people. You don't know which cases are, especially public defenders, you might not know which case was going to trial until the day before, but judges look at when they're filed and some judges will get upset that you filed your motion to eliminate at two or 3 a.m. the night before a trial. Um, even if they get upset with you though, your goal and your job is to make sure that they listen to your motion to eliminate and that they rule on it. So let's talk about the main topics in a DUI motion to eliminate. So as I said, hearsay and confrontation clause. Statements through dispatch or, unli or unlisted witnesses, these are going to go under hearsay and confrontation clause. And just for anyone who doesn't know, they are separate and apart, and you need to make an argument for each one. 
because not everything that is hearsay is, is a confrontation clause violation. Uncharged crimes, either it's pills that weren't tested or pills that for some reason weren't charged. Um, your client may be mentioning something else that happened before the DUI that wasn't charged. A lot of DUIs have around them uncharged crimes and you wanna make sure that any mention of them is, is not allowed in the trial and that if it's on body-worn camera, that that body-worn camera is redacted. If you're trying to get information redacted, your motion eliminate should not be heard the day of trial. The state's not gonna be able to redact that footage in time. That is a motion eliminate you're gonna to wanna to have heard earlier. Um, the case I cite for the next two points, it's a really important DUI case. I recommend everyone read. State versus Meador, 674 Southern 2nd, 826. It's a Florida Fourth District Court of Appeals case. So the first thing it stands for is that field sobriety exercises are just that, they're exercises. So officers can't use the word test, they can't use the words pass or fail. Again, that's really important because it allows the state not to strengthen the argument that field sobriety exercises are tests and that your client failed them. You don't want that kind of testimony coming out, it's gonna hurt your case. You want the fact that these are exercises. Make them lose credibility with the jury. The next is that officers can't testify about the horizontal gaze nystagmus, the HGN, unless they're DRE or a drug recognition expert certified. Most officers aren't gonna be DRE'd, so they're not gonna be allowed to talk about the HGN. They'll be allowed to talk about the pen test and talking about how someone's followed the directions, but not about the specific eye movement. So they'll be able to say, well, I gave him the instruction to keep his head still, and he didn't follow that, or he was swaying while doing the pen test, but they won't be able to talk about the smooth pursuit or the or the stink, distinct and the nystagmus. You don't want the scientific evidence coming in if they're not DRE certified, because then you don't have to fight it. And if you don't have to fight that evidence, it's better for you. Another great case to have is Martinez versus State. Um, that is a witness's opinion as to the guilt or innocence of the accused is not admissible. Again, you don't want officers testifying that they thought your client was guilty. A lot of judges don't like to just grant this one. They consider it more of a boilerplate one, but you want to try to get the arguments that are good for you in your motions in limine, which is that you don't want officers being allowed to say that they thought your client was guilty. And again, back to redactions. You want to make sure that you reviewed your body-worn camera and that you try to make an agreement with the prosecutor beforehand on which parts you want redacted out. If you try to do this the day of trial, it's not going to go well. So you want to do this about a week or two weeks before the trial. So that way you get out what you want out and the jury doesn't accidentally see it. Just because you and the prosecutor agree that you're only going to play minute one to minute two. But if you enter the entire disc in, they can go and watch whatever's left. They can go and press play in the jury room. And they can see the two to five minutes that you didn't play for the jury. So you want that video redacted. Um, let's talk about some practice tips for, for motions and lemonade. I always recommend bringing at least three copies, one for you, one for the judge, one for the state. If you have a trial partner, you wanna bring one for your trial partner so that they can mark along as to how each um, number was granted or denied. You wanna to try to ask the state which ones they agree to beforehand. Even if you're asking when the jury's on their way up, try to get some concessions early on. Judges will appreciate that. Um, you want to make sure you get the judge to rule on every single issue, and then you want to get that order in writing. So that's why I was saying your partner should have a copy of the motion in limine, and they can be writing number one granted, number two granted in part, number three, and then you take that order, you write it on a little short order, give it to the clerk, get the judge to sign it before you guys start voir dire. That way you have the pretrial rulings in the court file in case you need it for an appeal. And the most important thing is, even if your motion in limine is denied, you object during trial, or you're waiving that right for appeal. Especially in the Fourth District Court of Appeals, um, if you don't object contemporaneously, you've waived that objection, even if you objected 10,000 times beforehand. If you didn't object in that last time, you're waiving your issue, so you always need to object. You don't need to be rude, just make your objection, judge objection, same argument as my motion to eliminate. They deny it again, they deny it again. But again, it happening in the trial, the judge now has more facts than they had when you were making your motion to eliminate. Maybe they'll even grant it this time. Let's switch over now to voir dire or jury selection. So jury selection or jury deselection. This is the most important part of a jury trial. That's why we call it a jury trial because it's the jury. As I tell every single one of my clients, I go, if I could handpick every single member on your jury, I don't care what you're accused of, you could get a not guilty. Because if I got to pick all of your best friends, they're gonna find you not guilty. 
Same for the state. If the state could handpick every single person on your trial, it'd be a guilty no matter what the evidence is against you. That's why jury, That's why the jury selection process is so important. But the main goal is going to be to find out who is biased, get them to admit their biases on the record, and then get them stricken for cause. That's the main goal of jury deselection, is to figure out who you do not want on your jury, find a reason that they are not allowed to be on that jury, and then they're done. The second goal is to get the jury to like you and your client. This is your first and main opportunity to actually have conversations with the jury, and you have to use it as such. You have to show off a little bit of your personality, not just be a robot with a script, and get them to like you. Because most likely the state's gonna be a robot with a script, and they're not gonna like them, they're not gonna think they're human, where you are going to be humanizing yourself and your client, and they're gonna wanna agree with you over them. And the, the second, Secondary goal is to pre-try your case. Get ideas and concepts into the jury's mind before they hear any evidence so that when they do hear that evidence, they're viewing it in a light most favorable to you. And remember that practice makes perfect. Um, you can practice your voir dire on your friends and your family. They're gonna forgive you. Before I ever did my first voir dire in a courtroom, I practiced it um, on all my friends. They all got annoyed. But you're just getting people to speak. That's the purpose of voir dire. You're asking general questions. You're waiting for one juror to give you an answer. You're responding, and then you're asking other jurors, do they agree or disagree? And you're just trying to cause a conversation, and you're basically the, the mediator or the panelist of a conversation with the, with the jury selection panel. So we talked about that we want to figure out about someone's bias. So how do we figure out about them bi their bias? You have to ask them questions. You have to get them talking and engaged in what you're saying. So one thing that I see that happens a lot with people doing their first voir dire is that they run through their own script and they just keep talking and they just ask, do you agree or do you disagree? And they're doing all the talking. If you're doing all the talking, you're not doing a proper voir dire. The jurors should be doing the talking. The more time you're talking, the less time they're talking. That means the more time you're talking, the less they're talking and you're not learning about them. You have to find the balance of causing the conversation and then stepping back, letting them speak and then switching which jurors you want to hear from. So that way you're getting to hear from everybody and you're figuring out who has biases and maybe who, even who you like. So let's talk about DUI voir dires in specific. So one question that everyone loves to ask in a DUI voir dire is drinking and driving legal? Because the answer is yes. And that's not what we're here to discuss today. This is driving under the influence. That allows you then to talk to jurors about who here is a social drinker? If someone raises their hand and says there's a social drinker, what does that mean? What does social drinking mean to you? Okay, do you go to dinner and have a glass of wine? Yes, why? Well, because it's not illegal. Exactly, why is it not illegal? Because I'm not impaired. And then you talk about that. You can continue going, well, how do you know you're not impaired? Is it just one glass? Is it two glass? Do you know what number of glass equals you're impaired? And then you can talk about how do we determine if someone's impaired? Um, and you wanna be careful with this, because again, you don't want facts from your case that the officer is gonna say that your client was impaired coming out and then you're kind of pre-trying your own case against you. So this is an area where maybe you wanna say, are these signs of impairments that you would look for knowing that there were signs of impairments that your client didn't have. So if your client didn't have slurred speech, you can say, show of hands here, who knows that slurred speech is a sign of impairment? Okay, is that a big sign of impairment or a small sign of impairment? And you can go based off the ones that you know the officers aren't gonna testify about. Another important question to ask anyone is if they were negatively affected by a DUI. Um, this will usually come out during the judges. Judges usually have like a 10 to 15 question voir dire that they do before the state. You'll usually get these answers from the judge or the state attorney's voir dire. But if you don't, you have to know who is, who's been negatively affected by a DUI. Whether they were a victim of a DUI, they've lost a family member or a loved one to a DUI, or they've even had a DUI. These are typically people you're not gonna want on your DUI jury panels. Other people you're not gonna wanna want typically are people that don't drink. It depends on what your trial strategy is gonna be, but you wanna know who's a drinker and who isn't, who's a social drinker. You wanna know these answers so that way you can decide who's the best juror for your panel. Now, a big thing we need to discuss is there's two main ty types of DUI cases. There's breaths and there's breath refusals. Your case is gonna be one or the other, and you really should address it in voir dire or you're doing yourself and your client a disservice. So let's go into refusal first. 
So I always like to let the jury tell me why my client refused. And the way I do this is I ask a question. There's a very important word that you put in the question. What are some reasons why an innocent person would refuse to take an intoxilizer test? And the reason you have to ask it that way is because I had a trial partner who missed the innocent word. And he asked, what are some reasons a person would, would refuse a breathalyzer? And the first answer we got was, he's drunk. Everybody laughed. And that's what they're thinking of now. Again, you want to put perceptions in the, in the juror's mind while also figuring out who is a creative thinker that would be good for your panel. So you want the people who are going to say, well, maybe they don't trust the machine or they were already under arrest or they didn't understand what they were being asked, things like that. Those are the answers you're looking for. And if you don't get them, that's fine. Wait, see if anyone has one, call on some people and then you can give them out. Um, and again, the, the repeated comments that you're usually going to get are that people don't trust machines or they know breathalyzers don't work. Um, you want them to know that your client was already under arrest or that maybe they were even annoyed with the officer and they just didn't want to, you know, they trusted the officer and the officer arrested them. So they, they didn't want to help the officer anymore. Those are all plausible reasons why someone who is innocent would refuse the intoxilizer. And now when it comes to DUI breath, these are cases that people normally don't try as much as refusals, but they're still triable. Um, and as Adam was speaking about, you have to attack the intoxilizer and you also attack it in voir dire. So ask anyone, do they know how it works? Does anyone know the science behind an intoxilizer? No, okay. Then you ask people, do they trust all forms of science slash the evolution of science? So can someone share an example of a time when science was wrong? And nowadays there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna have a lot to say on that topic. Um, which is controversial, and it's okay to bring up controversial topics like that um, for this. I really like two different analogies, which my first one, I call it the doctor analogy. Second one is the metal detector analogy. So for the doctor analogy, it's that you feel perfectly fine, and but you decide you go to a back expert, and this is the best back surgeon in Florida, and he runs a test on you. You don't really understand what he did, but he told you you need to get surgery immediately, that you have to get surgery, but you feel fine show of hands here, who's gonna get that surgery? Most people won't raise their hands. Then you call on someone, why wouldn't you get that surgery? Would you want a second opinion first? Yeah, why? Because I feel fine, I don't know. So even though that's an expert, you don't just automatically trust them? No, I definitely want a second opinion. It's a great way to bring up the fact that just because a scientist or someone that we deem an expert is saying that we have to do something, doesn't always mean we do. Um, the metal detector analogy is that Every single person who was in that courtroom went through a metal detector. Show of hands here, who had the metal detector go off on them, but they had no metal on their body? You're gonna get some show of hands. So what does that mean? Was the metal detector right or wrong? Well, it had to be wrong, I didn't have metal on me. Okay, so we had a machine whose job it was to detect if you had metal on it, and it was wrong, yeah? Would you, tr would you trust your liberty? Would you trust that this metal detector was right all the time then? No. And that, again, it's another implementing that these intoxilizers, it's infallible science. It doesn't really work. And they don't know how it works. And because they don't know how it works, it's the government's job to prove to them that the science works and that your client's breath is something that they should consider. Um, if you are trying a breath case correctly, the jury should not care what the breath is. They should not believe that the breath was accurate or that it means anything about your client's breath at the time of driving. And Adam spoke about that a lot more. Um, and you don't want to forget your basic topics whenever you're doing a voir dire. No matter what the charge is, you want to talk about the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, reasonable doubt, whether or not your client is testifying and how they view that, and credibility of all witnesses. These are some basic cases that I think everyone should have in their trial binder um, as far as voir dire goes. So you have the right to voir dire on your defense. Um, there's the case. Um, hypotheticals are okay. So there's lots of judges who, for some reason, they don't like hypotheticals. If you come across a judge who doesn't, you can give them a copy of this case. And I think the most important one to have in your binder is that rehabilitation doesn't work. Um, a juror's subsequent statement that he or she could be fair should not necessarily control the decision to excuse a juror for cause when the juror has expressed genuine reservations about his or her preconceived opinions or attitudes. Again, it's whether or not you have a reasonable belief this jury could be fair and impartial. That's what you're looking for when you're trying to strike for cause. And it's really important that you, if you believe you have a cause challenge that you fight and you fight and you fight to not have to use your preemptory challenge. 
let's switch over to opening statements. So what is the purpose of opening statement? You're telling the jury what to look for, what not to look for, and what they're gonna see, and most likely in a DUI trial, what they're not gonna see or hear. Um, I love opening statements. I think they're very important, and I recommend that you don't just wing it. I always write out a couple bullet points for my opening statement. And the reason why is, th is this statistic I, I put on here. Um, as many as 80% of jurors make up their mind immediately after hearing opening statements. So I heard this and it resonated with me a lot, um, which is let's say this 80% is wrong. Let's lower it to 70. Let's lower it to 60. Let's lower it to 50. 50%. Half of your jurors have their minds made up by opening statements. That means you have a hung jury if, if you want openings. That's crucial. So if you pick the right jury and you had a great opening statement, you're now at a hung jury. That is very crucial for your case. So that's why you shouldn't just wing it. A lot of people think oh, it's opening statement. I'm just saying what the evidence is going to show. It's not important. It truly is an important part of the trial. And you don't want to waste your first opportunity to be convincing to the jury about your defense. So let's talk about a couple tips for opening. So again, we're going to talk about theme. You want to start off with your theme and incorporate it throughout the entire trial. And even if it's saying that your client's not guilty, it should be the first thing out of your mouth. Make it something memorable. You also want to humanize your client. And the way you humanize your client, you don't call them your client. You don't call them the defendant. Um, depending on the, the theme or how you are treating your client, you might want to call them by their first name if the judge allows you to and it works with, with, with your client. Again, if you have a younger client, you might want to call him Johnny. So that way he looks like a younger kid, but you don't want to be calling the older 80 year old man by his first name. Usually you want to be calling him Mr. Whatever, Mr. Smith. So that way he looks like an elder that we should be respecting. You always need to emphasize the burden. We don't have a burden of proof. The government has the burden of proof to prove their case beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. I always love to tell them where, how they're going to find not guilty. So they're going to find it through the lack of evidence, the conflict in the evidence, and the evidence itself. Again, that comes from the jury instructions. So you want to pick in your trial, where is the lack of evidence? Where is the conflict in the evidence? And what evidence do you have that supports that your client's not guilty? So the evidence you may have is also the lack of evidence. They intertwine with each other. It's okay. You don't have to use all three. If you only have one or two, use them though. Bring them out an opening. You'll see the jurors. They're going to write this stuff down. And that's what they're going to be looking for throughout the trial. Um, in DUIs, I love to pose questions to the state that I know they're not going to be able to answer because um, jurors like this. Again, I'll pose three questions that the state can't answer. When did my client drink? What did he drink? How much did he drink? They can't answer these three simple questions. And because you're going to have more questions than answers throughout this trial, you're going to have reasonable doubt. But the most important thing is to be yourself. If you're not, if you're not a super energetic person, don't do that for your opening. It's not going to come off as genuine. You have to be yourself so that way you can convey your theme and your theory and the purpose that your client is not guilty. The only way you do that effectively is by being yourself and not being somebody else. So let's talk about a couple do nots for opening. So I always say do not oversell, but luckily we're the defense. So we're allowed to pound the table. Um, it's much harder for you to oversell in, a, in an opening, but the state's going to oversell. And if it comes down to who they like and who they think they're telling the truth, they're going to believe you over the state if the state's overselling. So just make sure you're being believable. Again, if your client admitted to drinking, don't get up there and say, my client didn't have a single drink that day. There's no need. That's not your burden. Don't shift your burden to my client didn't drink when it's your client's not driving under the influence. That's why you don't need to oversell. And you don't want to take away from your opening. So a lot of people love to say, what I say is not evidence. What I say is not evidence means what I say is not important. That's fine. The state's going to say that, that what you say is not evidence. They can make that argument all they want. You want them paying attention to every single word you're saying because if you're not, you're saying it because it's important. So don't take away. If they're going to object to you being argumentative, then you can say the evidence will show. But I don't like using the evidence will show unless I'm getting objected to because it takes away from your opening. Just tell your story the way you want to. Be persuasive. In order to be persuasive, you can't be reading. So that's why I always like to write out bullet points and not full sentences when I'm doing my, my opening statements or my closings for a matter, because then you're not going to read. If you only have a couple words and not full sentences, you're less likely to read. 
Also, don't worry about being objected to. A lot of people are so concerned they're going to get objected to an opening um, that they take stuff out. It's okay to be objected to. All that happens when the state objects, the judge is going to sustain or overrule it. If they sustain it, you repeat exactly what you said and you say, sorry about that. The evidence is going to show and then repeat exactly what you said. And they just highlighted what your argument was. And all you did was say the evidence is going to show or the evidence is not going to show. So don't worry about being objected to. Don't get flustered. Don't go and make a face to the to the prosecutor or the judge. Just deal with it and continue with your argument. All right, let's switch gears now to the state's case in chief, cross-examinations. So cross-examination basics. Let's talk about what is the goal of cross-examination. And the goal of cross-examination is the goal throughout your entire trial. You want to lead to reasonable doubt. Let's talk about the basics, which is you're going to ask leading questions, which means your question is, el is eliciting a response. You're going to only want to put one fact per question in. And you want to take your time. You want to be methodical with your cross-examination. Death by a thousand swords. Let your good points sink in. So if you make a great point, stop, look at the jury, then go back to your cross-examination. That way they can understand. If you just hit them with a lot of zingers really quick, it might not be as impactful to the jury. Um, and one thing you don't want to do, especially for your first couple cross-examinations, you don't want to ask questions you don't know the answer to. So if you didn't have the opportunity to take depositions or if it's not in the report or and they didn't say it in direct, you might want to be careful asking the question because you might get an answer that you don't know how to deal with and then you put yourself in a pickle. Um, and always be prepared to impeach. So if you know that you have a contested area, have your body-worn camera minutes lined up, have your depot transcript ready, um, your trial partner should be ready to hand it or press play for you so that way you can have a smooth impeachment. So how do you prepare for your cross-examination? You have to review everything. And in reviewing everything, make sure you have everything. Go through the state's discovery exhibit, put a check mark next to what you have. If you don't have it, you better send an email and get it really quickly. Um, you wanna have probable cause affidavits. You wanna make sure you have all the supplemental reports. If you did the DMV formal review, which a lot of, again, public defenders, you're not gonna have those transcripts. But if you did, make sure you have those transcribes. Make sure you ordered your deposition transcripts that you have them. Make sure that you have all of your videos and that they're working. So the body-worn camera, the ink card video, the dash, bat facility is sometimes missing. Make sure you have all of it, that you reviewed all of it, and you have the important parts lined up. So that way, if you need to impeach or use it, you have it. And make sure you have the toxicology report if it's a breath case. Next, you want to write out your cross-examination. Um, this is going to be for the arresting officer. So when I do my arresting officer cross-examination, I write it out like a book in separate chapters. And these are the chapters I go through and the ones we're gonna go through really quickly. Chapter one is gonna be the intro, the background, the building the officer up. Chapter two is gonna be about the stop or how the officer got involved um, with my client. Number three is gonna be from that initial interview to when he began his, started hunting for a DUI. Then we have the DUI investigation, the field sobriety exercises, arrest and post arrest. And again, not every chapter is the same size. Your biggest chapters are gonna be chapter four and five, the DUI investigation and the FSEs. So as we discussed, the goal of crossing an arresting officer, same goal as any other cross-examination, same goal as the entire trial, to get to reasonable doubt. What are we focusing on though for the arresting officer? Lack of evidence of impairment, the things the officer did wrong and the things that your client did right. The things the officer could have easily done or asked and did not. So again, that goes to things the officer did wrong, that the officer did an improper and inadequate and incomplete investigation. Those are things you want to highlight, as well as the things your client did right. So did your client get out of the car without stumbling? Did he do really well on a certain field of sobriety exercises? These are things you're going to want to highlight. At the end of every cross-examination, the jury should believe that you are the DUI expert, not the officer, and understand that the DUI investigation better, that they should believe that you understand DUI investigations better than the officers. That's an effective cross-examination of, of a DUI officer, is you take away their credibility and now you're the credible DUI expert. Chapter one is the intro and background. So the main points to highlight are if an officer has lack of training or experience and that they did an improper investigation. Lock them in that it's their job to collect evidence. Always lock them into this and lock them into the fact that 
all relevant facts are in the reports. So I do both of these for two different reasons. So the lock them in to collect evidence, there's usually gonna be some piece of evidence not collected. Did they see an open container in your client's car and that's not getting admitted into trial? Um, was there a statement of an independent witness that they didn't take? There's always gonna be a piece of evidence that they didn't collect and you wanna exploit them because the jury watches Law & Order SVU. They expect that they're gonna have every single piece of evidence and especially in these misdemeanor DUI, they're not gonna have it. The next is to lock them in that all relevant facts are in their report. Um, I ask this very early on before I start hitting them with facts because then they can't go and say, oh, well, yeah, that isn't in my report, but I definitely saw that. Officer, I asked you at the beginning, were all relevant facts in your report? And you said yes. So you're changing that answer now. Yeah, so after you reviewed your report, after you testified on direct examination, this is the first time you're adding that to your testimony and they're gonna really lose their credibility if they try that. So the chapters two and three kind of go together, the, the pre-DUI investigation. Again, you're gonna focus on the lack of investigation. It might've only been a minute or two from when they stopped your client to when they started their DUI investigation. You wanna emphasize how short of a time that is, that they only took a minute and a half to realize whether or not they knew your client. That's not enough time to get to know someone. So the officer is gonna point on the signs of impairment that he saw, and your job is to attack those signs of impairment, how there's innocent reasons those signs are not attributed to the signs of impairment. So examples are that red eyes. Well, red eyes can be caused by allergies. Is that correct, officer? Yeah, did you ask him if he had allergies? No, did you ask him if he's on allergy medication? No, is it allergy season? No, you didn't ask any of these questions? No, could you have asked those questions? Yes, I could have, but you chose not to, right? That wasn't worth your time. Um, then we're going to go into the DUI investigation. You're going to focus on the fact that the officer is making assumptions and doesn't know your client. So again, sees, hears, talks, judges, and says drive a car. Why do I have those examples? Those are the exact thing that the jury instructions define as normal faculties. This officer doesn't know your client. As we just said, they probably met your client for three or four minutes. They don't know how they see. They don't know what they're hearing is. They don't know if they have an accent. If they're from this country, they don't know any of that. They don't know if they judge distance and they never saw them driving except for this one, one instance. Again, if we have a 19 year old and a NASCAR driver, we expect two different types of driving patterns. So without knowing who your client is, how can they say how they normally do these things? They can't, they're making assumptions. The next chapter five is the field sobriety exercises. This is the most, if your client did field sobriety exercises, this is gonna be one of the most important parts of your cross-examination. And you need to write out every question by question, line by line, go through the entire body-worn camera video if there is one, and be ready. Um, I love using NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration guidelines for writing out my FSE cross-examination. And these are the two websites where you can get, where you can get those documents. Um, it's gonna show you how officers are trained to conduct DUI investigations in the field to write exercises, so what, what instructions are they required to give? And then what clues are they required to look for? Because that's all that matters. And if they deviate from either of those, the exercises are invalid. They're not reliable. So you're gonna focus on, did they give the right instructions according to NHTSA? So if they didn't, you wanna get them to say, if they, if they fail to give the right instructions, it affects the reliability of the exercises. They, they have to, they have to say that. Same with looking for the right clues. If they weren't looking for the right clues, the exercises are less reliable. They should concede to that. If not, it doesn't sound reasonable and you argue it to the jury in closing. You also want to emphasize how goal, how the goal is so high for field sobriety exercises. So for the walk and turn, it has 16 separate instructions. And if you only do four of them wrong, you have an unsatisfactory performance. So again, if your client did 12 out of 16 exercises correctly, but they still were considered unsatisfactory or they were still arrested, that's not reasonable. Again, he walked on the line, he didn't stumble, he counted out loud correctly, he didn't use his hands, he did all of these things correctly, but he was still arrested. We saw how he performed, he, his normal faculties weren't impaired. I always love focusing on the fact that your client was given one chance to do these. The opportunity to do so was under nervous conditions. Maybe there were cars coming by, lights and sirens going off, um, obviously he's panicked because an officer is asking him to do these things and he was distracted by other things going on. You want to point to all signs of innocence as to why 
the few things your client did poorly, why those aren't signs of impairment and why they're signs of someone just being a normal person. Chapter six and seven are the post arrest. Um, this is gonna be for refusal cases. You need to highlight the fact that they were only asked to give a breath sample after being arrested. So the officer made a determination that your client was guilty of DUI and then asked for breath sample. So how does that make sense to a normal jury? Now we all know that that's just a protocol they follow, but that's something you could argue in closing is they had all the evidence they needed. That's why they arrested him. Why would they arrest him and then ask for more evidence? You also need to remind the jury that even if he blew a 0, 0.000 that day, there's no unarrest, there's no being unarrested. If he blew a zero, they were gonna ask for urine. If they blew a zero, he was spending that night in jail regardless. Those are both really important facts that have to come out in refusal cases. Then let's talk about breath cases. So there's multiple ways to attack breath and you wanna use them all. Adam went through them in plethora. I'm gonna just hit a couple of them really, really quickly. So typically the breath sample is gonna be taken about an, an hour later than driving, sometimes two, sometimes three. Um, that's not the burden the state has to prove. The state needs to prove their breath level at the time of driving, not an hour later. And every breath tech will testify that they can't testify to what their breath was at the time of driving based off a breath test an hour later. So it's not even important. And the reason why they can't, can't testify to what it is, is the two breath samples that they get, it can't tell you whether or not someone's eliminating alcohol or absorbing alcohol. So it can't tell whether their numbers are going up or down. Um, there's a formula that they can use to do this. No one that you do a cross-examination on on a normal DUI will know how to do this formula. And even if they did, they can't do it with two breath samples. They'll need more breath samples to do it. Typically, the breath tech is never gonna even know how the machine works. Their job is to just turn it on, tell your client to blow, 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 until the butt, until it beeps, sit them down, wait 20 minutes, do it again. That's their job. They don't know the, the science behind it. And you wanna attack the fact that they don't know the science behind it. Because if they don't know the science behind it, why do we trust the science? You also wanna attack that blood is more accurate. So in DUI manslaughter cases, they take blood samples only, not breath, and they take two different blood samples a long time apart from each other. So that way they can do that formula to determine what their blood, blood sample was, their blood alcohol content was at the time of driving. That wasn't done in this case. And again, we don't have a burden, it's the state's burden. Why didn't they use the more accurate science? So you're gonna attack the machine as much as you can, you're gonna attack the science as much as you can. Let's switch over now to the judgment of acquittal. So rule 3.380 is a motion for judgment of acquittal. Um, there's two different ones. So they have slightly different standards from the first to the second. So the first is viewing the evidence in light most favorable to the non-moving party. The state has failed to prove a prima facie case of driving under the influence because, and then you have to insert your argument. Um, you wanna attack each element. You wanna attack both elements. Even if you have very little to say, attack it, as, attack it, don't waive your argument. The second JOA is under the higher burden in viewing the evidence in light most favorable to the state. No reasonable jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed driving under the influence because, and then you're most likely gonna repeat the same exact argument. Um, again, you're attacking every element, actual physical control and impairment. Um, I have gotten a judgment of acquittal on impairment. It's very rare. It was a second judgment of acquittal that happened, but that's why you have to make the argument. If I just sat there and I gave a boilerplate argument, the judge might not have granted it, even if she believed the evidence showed that because I didn't make the argument well enough. Treat these as arguments and don't, wait, don't waste your opportunity. If you get it granted, it's phenomenal. Um, make sure that they state proved venue, make sure they identified the client. Um, these are two very important things that sometimes don't happen in a trial. It's very rare that it hasn't happened, but it does happen, especially in misdemeanor DUI trials. If it's two first time prosecutors trying a case, maybe his trial partner didn't remind him, he missed the venue, that's an easy JOA, and you just gotta win for your client. So let's talk about the next part of trial, which would be the defense's case and whether or not your client's gonna take the stand or not. So the most important thing is, it's your client's decision, not yours. All you can do is advise them to the decision and let them know your belief and hope they trust your judgment. So the pros of your client testifying is it can lead to reasonable doubt. Um, jurors get to know your clients better and may like them, and they can explain away signs of impairment. But let's look at the cons. Your client can come off bad, meaning that they now don't like your client. Your client can incriminate themselves and your client has nothing to add. 
Um, I love in voir dire to bring up when talking about client testifying, taking a knee in a football game. So you ask someone, why does a team take a knee? And it's because they've already won and they don't want to risk losing. So it's a concept that helps a jury kind of understand why your client chose not to testify, which was there was no need to. He didn't want to risk it. Um, I think it's a better, it sometimes relates to people more because it's a football analogy that they understand than just citing the constitution to them. But again, you have to be concerned. If you put your client up there, what your client says may, may, or break, may make or break the case. There have been cases where you would have had the not guilty had your client not testified and vice versa. So it's a decision that you and your client have to make in every case. Um, if your client didn't admit to drinking on the scene, but there's an odor of alcohol, you better believe that a decent prosecutor is going to bring that up. And he better have something to say other than, no, I didn't drink anything. I don't know why I smelled like alcohol. The jury's most likely not going to believe that. So those are questions like that that you need to talk to your client about. Hey, these are potential questions you're going to get asked. We're going to have to deal with it. Do you think your answer is going to help or, or hurt us? Lastly, let's go to closing arguments. So this is everyone's usually favorite part of the trial. It's the showtime. You're bringing it all together. Um, remember to be confident and make a connection with the jury. So the formula for a closing argument is kind of the same formula for an opening. It's you're going to go over your theme again, an evidence review, talk about what great evidence came out for you, highlight that burden, highlight that the burden's beyond into the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. It's not your burden. It's their burden. Why you won, why they lost, and conclude. It's really important. You can repeat yourself in a closing argument, but you don't need to. If you get up there and you do give a five-minute closing argument, that's totally fine. I would hope you give a little bit more, maybe like 10 minutes. But if all you have to say is five minutes worth of stuff and then you feel like you're rambling, it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to use all of your time. Just because a judge gives you 15 minutes doesn't mean you have to use the 15 minutes. Um, it depends on your case. If it's a one officer case, officer didn't say that much, you might not have a 20 minute closing argument. That's totally fine. So let's talk about the do's and don'ts of closing arguments. So the do's, you're, obviously you wanna be persuasive. You wanna be prepared. You wanna have stuff written out. You have to use your jury instructions. Weighing the evidence is one of the most important one. You wanna use your time correctly. As I was saying, you're gonna get a time limitation. Don't get 15 minutes and then not finish what you have to say and be only halfway through your closing when your time's up. You're going to want to rebut the state's arguments. They went up first. If they made a really good point, highlight why their point wasn't that good. Um, and I love to use at least one thing from voir dire. I like to use way more if possible, depending on how good the voir dire is. But remember when juror number three said, you can't convict if you didn't have enough evidence. And look what we heard. We heard no evidence in this case. So juror number three, we know you're not going to be able to find my client guilty. Whatever it is that they gave you, whatever nugget that they gave you in closing argument, make sure you keep that nugget, write it down, have your trial partner write it down and relay it to the jury again in closing arguments. And you'll see them start nodding along. Oh yeah, I did say that. Yeah, that resonates with me. And then you're able to better connect with them. Let's talk about the don'ts. Um, don't attack, attack opposing counsel. Try not, don't get personal. Um, I always try to just refer to them as the government um, throughout my entire trial with them. I like using the word government. People don't like this the word government. So I like doing that. I don't like using their names. Um, one thing that I see a lot in first closing arguments is people just yelling conclusions. He wasn't driving under the influence. He's not guilty and just repeating them, repeating them, repeating them, but not explaining how they got there. Well, we know he's not guilty because we know he didn't commit DUI. How do we know he didn't commit DUI? Well, he didn't even have actual physical control of the vehicle. We heard officer testify to blank, blank, and blank. We know his normal faculties weren't impaired. We got to watch the body-worn camera. In the body-worn camera, you heard him talking okay. You heard him, you saw with your own eyes that he was walking totally fine. He wasn't staggering, he wasn't stumbling. We saw all of this. And maybe you got to see driving pattern. We got to see him operate a motor vehicle. There were no issues. He was pulled over for speeding. Attack with analysis. You know, remember Iraq. You need the rule and the analysis to get to the conclusion. You know the rule, the rules and the jury instructions. You need that analysis. You need to explain how they get to not guilty. And when you're trying to be persuasive, we talk about we talked about in opening, I'm gonna talk about it in closing, don't read. I really recommend going up with bullet points and I really recommend going up with notes. I think if you go up to a closing argument without any notes in front of you, you're gonna forget your important points and you're gonna miss it. It's okay to pause. It's okay to look down, gather yourself, 
and make your arguments. And again, lastly, don't make baseless arguments. If your client had an odor of alcohol, you don't need to argue that they didn't drink. That's not the burden. Don't put a burden that doesn't exist in your case. And don't make baseless arguments that now the jury doesn't trust you. Uh, I want to go over some of the main objections in closing. So disparaging the defense is a really good, is a really common one, especially in misdemeanor trials. So them calling your defense a distraction, a smoke show, um, telling them to completely disregard it. These are all things that you can object to disparage, disparaging the defense. Um, you really have to look forward to an improper burden shifting happening in any misdemeanor trial, especially a refusal case. They're going to say, well, why didn't he blow? The law allows them to talk about consciousness of guilt, which is he blew because he knew what the test was going to show. That's fine, but they can't talk about, well, we don't know what the breath is because he didn't blow. That's going to be improper burden shifting. Don't let them improper burden shift. Um, if you get an improper burden shifting, you don't want to just object. You might even want to move for a mistrial. That's something you need to talk to with your client before you move for the mistrial. Um, it's part of their decision as well. You want to look for golden rule objections. So is the juror ask, is the state asking the juror to put themselves in the position of, of another party? So what would you have done in that situation? What if you were the car he hit? Those are all improper golden rule arguments. Again, you want to object. You might want to move for a mistrial. Um, not as, not as blatant and egregious as improper burden shifting, but something you may consider. And an improper argument, um, message to the community. So we need to stop drunk drivers. If you don't vote guilty, um, you're going to allow them to do this again. You don't want any kind of comments like that being made. Again, with misdemeanor uh, prosecutors, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what arguments they're going to make in closing arguments if you've never seen them try a case before. So you have to watch out for all of these. So that's all I have. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed this. I hope it helped you. If you have any specific questions, feel free to scan the QR code, email me. Um, I'm happy to share any of my DUI trial prep materials that I have. I have, it, I have all my pro trial prep materials from all my DUI trials. So I'm here to help. I hope you guys found this really informative. Thank you guys.